Ladies and gentlemen, it is 4th of July weekend. I'm in Portland, Maine. Getting ready to release my next episode with somebody that has been on my wish list to interview for a very long time. He's a former boss of mine, former Navy SEAL, CEO of Blackwater, did a ton of work with Central Intelligence Agency until they ousted him. We get the full story. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Eric Prince. And if you wanna be a patriot this 4th of July weekend, leave me a review on iTunes and sign up for our free email newsletter. We push out all kinds of free content on the newsletter links in the description other than that that's all i'm asking have a great fourth of july weekend and god bless america cheers love you all promise to uh solemnly swear that the testimony amid fresh reports of reckless behavior by blackwater in iraq Blackwater's CEO, Eric Prince, made no apologies to a congressional investigating committee. I disagree with the assertion that they acted like cowboys. And it says three senators, Joe Biden, Chuck Cagle, and John Kerry, the future vice president, secretary of defense, and secretary of state, respectively, posed while waiting for Blackwater rescue. Their U.S. Army helicopter got lost in a blinding snowstorm and set down in Taliban territory on the side of a mountain. Do not ever discount the Iranian influence on the Biden-Obama administration then, as there is now. He said, Mr. President, give us the authorities and a billion dollars, and in three weeks the flies will be walking in the eyeballs of our enemies. Prince said his employees act with restraint and professionalism. He boasted that none of the U.S. diplomats he has paid to protect have been killed or wounded. It, it was a great honor that they turned to us because it was a very important mission, right? Because the CIA is the ones who made that victory possible for the United States. We've had a better response from Blackwater than we have from the State Department. We fought back on all fronts. The one place that they had us over a barrel was in the State Department. Witnesses say the two SUVs were ambushed as they drove through town. Another convoy of guys that got ambushed and shot up on the Baghdad Highway. The contractors worked for Blackwater Security, a company that protects coalition personnel. Knowing that the clowns at the State Department and the Obama administration did everything they could to block a program like that, because it's not something they directly controlled, it is such a mess. It is such a fetid swamp. Trump was right to call it a swamp. It is. You know, guys, the older I get, the more obsessed I get with the maintenance of my own lawn. But it's a big job. So I started paying somebody to do it, and I would love when they would put these little designs in my lawn. But one thing I started noticing is I started missing all the little nooks and crannies. And that's an equipment issue. Then I found Manscaped. Thanks to the Lawnmower 4.0, it's real easy to get those wide open spaces and has a light on it so now I can mow my lawn in the dark. Then there's those hard to reach things. Thanks to the Weed Whacker, I'm no longer standing in the front of the mirror on one foot with the other foot above my head trying to get all those hard to reach places when my wife walks in and you have that awkward look on your face. <laughs> Get 20% off and free shipping with code SHAWN, S-H-A-W-N at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code SHAWN. It's time that you enjoyed the finer things in life and get yourself a platinum package for your platinum package. Shave your balls. Be a man.
Eric Prince, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sean. So I've worked for you under Blackwater Worldwide, Blackwater USA, and um, after I left all that, I started this and not realizing what it would turn into, and you were actually the number one person uh, that I wanted to interview. I <laughs> never actually thought it would happen, so this is all very surreal for me, so I just want to say thank you for coming. It's a Thanks real, for having me. Real honor to have you here. I'm, it's always great to see guys that have worked with us pivot to something else spectacular and do well. Thank so you. So congratulations. Thank you for that. So just a little introduction. You were a Navy SEAL on the officer side. You were the founder and CEO of Blackwater, the largest private military contracting company in the world still to this day. Uh, also the only PMC company to ever not lose an asset or a... a, a protectee. A, yeah, protectee. Uh, a billionaire nope. until... Far from that one's that that's a gross distortion. That's a massive inflation of my net worth. Well, thank you for being honest. Uh, until recently, the head of a private equity equity firm, Frontier Resource Group. You are on the Iranian hit list, and well known uh, in the media is the guy behind the CIA assassination program, and a father of twelve which yes. I recently thought seven, but 12. So we have a double Brady Bunch family. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you're old enough to have remembered the Brady Bunch. I am. All right. I am. <laughs> and so in doing some of my research, I talked to some of your colleagues, one of which had mentioned that you are like a modern day Bruce Wayne. You sit at home and you think of out-of-the-box ways to solve a lot of the things that are going on in the world. And uh, I actually thought that was a fairly accurate description, so I wanted to bring that up. But um, before we get into the interview, which we're going to talk about a lot of different things, I get everybody a gift. Oh, there you go. Thank you. All right, gummy bears. Those are gummy bears. Those Fantastic. Are vigilance, legal in all 50 states. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, good to go. I'm, I'm a sucky for. I'm a sucker for gummy bears. Thank you. Perfect. Um. So I have a subscription group called on Patreon under the Vigilance Elite, and I give them an opportunity to ask each guest a question, and I pick one. And I thought this was a, a fairly good question. With the way the economic, with the way the economy is today, everybody is waiting for the rug to kind of get pulled out from under it. And nobody really knows where to put their money. Where does Eric Prince invest his money other than your personal business ventures? Um, the stock market seems certainly uh, overhyped because of the amount of liquidity that's been pumped into the society. And it, to me, I guess it comes down to what do people have to buy to survive, right? In, in, a, in a world of um, uh, turbulence, it comes down to people making choices as to nice to have versus have to have. And so investing in, um, if you can do any kind of value investing into things that people have to buy versus want to buy, that's, uh, that's probably the safest bet. Interesting. You know? And in and, and this argument of cryptocurrencies versus gold and all the rest, you know, the fact is gold has for millennia been a valued medium of exchange. And it's never been worth zero. It's never, uh, it's never quite collapsed. And so uh, having, a, um, uh, having part of a portfolio in an in a actual hard currency <laughs> like gold or some would even say in brass or in loaded ammunition components, or look look at the look at even what the cost of that has been um, over the past few years, as the cost of copper has gone to ten thousand dollars a ton, and um, you know driving all those prices upwards. So it's it's not a bad hedge. Interesting. Are you into crypto at all? Yes, a you bit. You are. You think it's here to stay? 
Uh, I think it is because um, the increasing cartelization of big banks and their leverage over people that cryptocurrencies will um, will find a way to be an alternative medium of exchange to the detriment of big banks, which is good. Um, if you think about monetary history in the United States, there used to be lots of different privately issued currencies, right? I mean, even after the American Revolution, you had the continental dollar and you had other people issuing dollars, usually based on uh, issuing currencies based on some kind of, backed by some kind of t uh, silver or gold or backed by a gold mine or something. And so it's not unusual to have a lot of different competing currencies, as you see. And in the crypto world, yes, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of uh, nonsense to it, but there's some underpinning uh, value stuff like Bitcoin uh, and some of those uh, mainstream coins. They're very much here to stay. You think Ethereum's here to stay? Ethereum? Yeah. I think so. Interesting. I wasn't expecting you to say that, but the more I dive in, the more the more open people are to it. It's I find it fascinating that I feel like we're on a currency revolution. Yes, we are. I think if so, one of the things that in Africa, right, you have a thing called M-Pesa, which is cell phone banking, and it was hugely empowering for poor across Africa that didn't have a bank account, but they had a cell phone, even a little flip phone, because they could transfer or receive a couple of dollars, a few cents, small amounts of money. Um, and it, because it, it reduced their transaction costs, they didn't have access or even proximity to a bank to do that, let alone the corruption or other nonsense that might go with with banks in some of those jurisdictions. So an M-Pesa account allowed them to buy and sell goods or their labor and, and bank it. I think cryptocurrencies are going to do that for the rest of the world with secure wallets, with exchanges that um, people will... Um, be able to buy and sell goods uh, rapidly and effectively. And for all the noise also about cryptocurrency being used for uh, for crime, it's the ultimate in transparency, right? Because it's a blockchain. It's You can trace every transaction in where it's gone and, um, and in who has it. So, Well, thanks for sharing that. But, so as far as the interview is concerned, I would like to, we have so much to cover. I want to talk a lot about current events towards the end, but... What I really want to do at the beginning is talk about just your career up to this point and then get into some of the current events. So you grew up, your dad was a monster entrepreneur, uh, very wealthy. Not a lot of people can relate to that. And very many people are interested in that kind of lifestyle. And in your book, I think you give a great description of what that was like and some of the lessons that your dad talked to. So can you go... Can you go into a little bit of your childhood? What was that like? Sure. Well, let me first start by talking about my dad, because both my parents certainly shaped me. And uh, I'm 100% Dutch, born in Holland, Michigan. And um, it was a Dutch colony. It was a Dutch community founded in the 1840s from some religious pilgrims that came from the Netherlands. But it's a very hardworking, very industrious area. And my dad's, my dad's dad died when my father was 13. And that was kind of in the Great Depression. And so he was thrust from being a kid to being the man of the family. And my, um, uh, my grandmother had a, um, as a widow with three kids, was very independent and was not accepting or looking for any welfare from anybody, not from the state, not from the church, not from anybody. And so, you know, my dad installed the hot water heater in their house at age 14 by wow. himself. I mean, literally taking one length of pipe at a time, going to a local hardware store, measuring it, cutting it, coming back and, and you know, sweating the joint and he put it in and it still worked. So my dad worked 40 hours a week in middle school and high school already. And he, he played sports one season. Um, he played football one season, but the rest of the time he worked. He was managing a car dealership at 16 and he put himself through college and, um, was off in the Air Force for a couple of years after college because it was draft then. He was in the he was an Air Force photo reconnaissance officer. But the man knew how, because he had to, work to provide. 
And when he was, uh, he went to work for a machine tool maker. They made big diecast machines. And the business was sold. He didn't like the new ownership. And so he left with six other guys and took... Now, my dad already had three kids, mortgage on the house, and he remortgaged everything, okay? And, and his mother, who'd managed to save $10,000 as a single mom in the 40s and 50s, put $10,000 on her son as equity into what became Prince Corporation. And my dad started making die-cast machines, and then in the early 70s, they patented the lighted sun visor. Um, one of the smart guys at the company, Con Marcus, developed the, the, you know, when you get in a car, you tip the visor down, you lift the lid up with the lights, with the mirror, and the lights that come on, that was that was their patent. And um, they made the first 5,000 for Cadillac before they ever made one. Wow. Because uh, dad said... They sold it on a balsa wood model. <laughs> and then these Cadillacs said, yep, we'll take 5000 And then it was a scramble to figure out how to make those things. And um, and they just did it. They figured it out. And so the, the Prince Corporation made um, all kinds of stuff inside of a car. And that so that's the environment I grew up in. Um, I remember... Um, and my dad got invited to go to uh, to Eastern Europe and to to Russia, right? Because they wanted to buy his machines. And he went to Moscow, had the whole surveillance tale, and he hated the whole fit and feel of the place. And he came back. And after that, we did a long van tour. He shipped a, a 1975 Chevy van to Europe. And we did a, a six-week road trip one summer, and we drove through... Western Europe and Eastern Europe, uh, and I had my my seventh birthday in East Berlin, and I'll never forget that as a seven year old. And the guns, the dogs, the minefields, the tank traps, all of that facing in on East Germany, literally a national prison camp, keeping people from escaping. And I think it had a, a pretty uh, direct effect on me because I kind of figure out that communism is not such a great idea yeah. if you had to have that level of control to keep people from leaving. Well, I figured that out at seven years old. Well, yeah, you know, and it probably stimulated my interest in history and, and reading and all the rest. And I remember we went to Normandy um, in 1980. And uh, so as an 11-year-old, I was the kind of the family geek that gave the tour, right? This is Sword, Gold, Juno, Utah, Omaha Beach. There's Pegasus Bridge and... Yeah, so I uh, I, I kind of lived and, and read and consumed that kind of information. I was uh, was kind of a loner growing up. Um, I hunted and trapped. I had a, a cousin, Derek, who was a great outdoorsman, and his dad. The, the whole side of the Zweep family were outdoorsmen, and that's where I got it from. And they, um, uh, you know, shooting uh, shooting water water bugs with a uh, with a BB gun. And um, I hunted, I trapped uh, muskrats and raccoons for three years. So you know, as a as a fourth, fifth, and a sixth grader, I was out on my bike early in the morning, going to you know, check my traps before school. It was a it was a good experience. Were you involved in the family business at all? Not at all. Not at all. Not interested, or a not interested, but b it was also policy that you have to go do your own thing. So even if I was really interested, there was never never even an option. So my dad's policy for my sisters and I is that you had to go do something else before you ever come and work in the family business. At what point did that become clear? What age? Uh, it was, I, th I think since birth. I was just the never whole time. even. Yeah. Well, I mean, as the business grew and became very large, it was 5,000 employees by, by the late 80s, by about the time I was graduating high school. I'd always wanted to be in the military. And I applied to uh, Air Force and Navy. Um, I got into both academies and um, I went Navy. I was a pilot. I got my uh, pilot's license, or I sold it when I was 16, the morning of my 16th birthday. Got my license when I was 17 and uh, was hell bent to be a Navy pilot. And, and, and truly showing about how low profile the SEAL teams were then. This is me. I was a geek that paid attention to all things military, and I didn't even know that much about the SEAL teams because I went to the academy, knowing um, 
knowing I wanted to be a pilot. And that was it was even the year after Top Gun came out. Oh. <laughs> but um, I remember a year, it was the it was the spring of my freshman year, plebe year at the academy. And these two SEAL officers, they were the liaison guys, came and gave the brief as to what SEAL teams do. And they said, hey, if you ever want to, you know, come down to PT with us, you can. Be at this field at 5.30 tomorrow. And I showed up there at 5.30 and they said, okay, today we're just going to run a mile. Get a partner. Put them on your shoulders. <laughs> I was hooked, man. I loved it. And I remember, uh, I remember going to the pool. Right, because I I played sports in high school, in middle school, but um, I was not much of a swimmer, even having grown up on the lakes. And I remember swimming the first fifty meters, and I felt like my lungs were going to fall out of my chest. But uh, but a hundred meters became two hundred, became you know, and I became a, a pretty good swimmer. But um, yeah, that that started my trajectory of wanting to be a seal. But I ended up le- I left the academy um, after three semesters voluntarily. I was not kicked out, um, but uh, I went to Hillsdale College, and um, I had a good experience there. Why did you leave the academy? <sighs> because I was not convinced it was, I think great leaders went to the academy and survived it, because it was not producing them. And it was, I'd say it was an early indicator of the kind of political correctness that has infected the rest of many of American schools, right? And, you know, if you think there's a problem with the universities, imagine one run by the federal government. And so this is 87, 88. I mean, growing up in, in Holland, Michigan, um, I was active in school. I played, I think, I only missed one season of one year playing some kind of high school sport at a varsity level. I was involved in all that. But I was so focused on joining the military, I think I missed most of the fun times of high school experience that most kids look back on. Okay. Still have regrets for that. But um, going to Hillsdale, it was a good experience. Um, I remember I had a, um, a prof named Alexander Stromas, who was in exile. He'd been kicked out of the Soviet Union. And so right as the Soviet Union is teetering on collapse... Alexander Stromas had been a law school classmate of Mikhail Gorbachev. So it was a fantastic window into what was actually happening there. And so between a really good economic education, right? Because Hillsdale is one of two schools in the country that accepts no federal funding. Why don't they accept federal funding? Because with federal money comes federal strings. So it is it is a fiercely libertarian school, and it was... It was actually one of the first schools in the country to accept women and minorities as well. Really? Yeah. Does it still not accept federal Zero. money? Zero. Interesting. Because I had thought about leaving the academy and trying to go to ROTC or you know, some other commissioning source. And they said, that's great, but you have to go to the ROTC training at Michigan State or somewhere else. But it's not here because it's federal money. Okay. So, But while I was at Hillsdale, I joined the fire department. Uh, probably within two months of being there. And that was a, um, I would say I learned more about leadership and the fire department than in a very artificial lab at the academy, right? Because at the academy, they have the upper class, right? Some classman that's one or two years ahead of you trying to teach you leadership. And what is, what is a, what have you, what, what is a sophomore or a junior or a senior in college done to warrant them teaching leadership, right? There's not a lot of Mustang, former enlisted kids that are going to the academy. It's college kids. And I would compare that to the fire department where earning the trust of the the butcher, the carpenter, or the professional fireman that were on the squad to perform well enough to go inside of a burning building, right? Because Hillsdale County is not a super affluent county, so there was quite a few structure fires Um You know, I've got to do a lot of cool things in my life, but driving a fire truck to a fire, lights and siren, is still up there on the, definitely the top five list. (laughs) But um, I did that, and um, uh, I got, uh, I dove with the county sheriff's department doing body recoveries. um, Because people would go out on the ice, uh, on the lakes, during the wintertime, running motorcycles and, um, and snowmobiles, inevitably, 
at least one a weekend. Somebody was going through the ice, and you have to go recover the sled, and sometimes you have to recover a body. Wow, so how was, many uh, how many bodies do you think you've recovered? Uh, three bodies and many sleds. Wow, did that affect you? Do you think? Uh, it made me pretty cautious. Yeah, yeah, but I was cheap in college, and because I these guys were diving in dry suits, I was diving a wetsuit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was. It was epically cold until I got smart enough and I took uh, some uh, some milk jugs in a cooler that I would fill with hot water. So I'd pour water in the suit first, get, you know, so you don't have that uh, first thirty seconds of massive cold as the uh, as the wetsuit becomes wet. <laughs> nice. <clears throat> Your dad seemed like he was a great leader as well, and yep. so since we're on the topic of leadership, the academy, moving into the fire department and learning a lot of leadership lessons there, it seems like your dad was a very generous uh, guy that took care of his people, gave back to the community. Did that carry over to you? Yeah. You know what? My um, It was described of my dad at his funeral that he was a rising tide that lifted all boats. And um, he really believed in community and... Um, making the community a spectacular place that people would want to live in. And they did a, a great care and share program where um, when the company made money, if the employees wanted to chip in and pick 10 charities to support, the company would match it all. Um, he ended up giving uh, a big chunk of the company to the employees. And, you know, he said, and I, I've really taken this on board, that one of the greatest things you can do for somebody is to give them a great job where they feel valued, empowered, and they're happy, they're proud to go home to their families at night. And he told the story, you know, there was one of the very, very early employees was a guy who was, I guess he was partially mentally disabled, right? But the guy was, he was having a hard time sweeping the floors. And the guy would get overwhelmed. He didn't want to quit. And my dad said, nope, you can do it. Come on, stay at it, stay at it, stay at it. And, and, and after 30 years, and he grew in the, the janitorial division of the business, because of the employee stock, because of when he started, the guy retired as a multimillionaire. Wow. And uh, it was a, a great analogy to how empowering giving somebody a great job is. That's incredible. And employing them at their, at their best level. Well, skipping forward just a little bit, and then we'll come back. When you, when Blackwater was was up and going, I know a lot, a lot of those guys were extremely proud to be a part of that outfit, and and so I definitely see that it carried over. Did did you realize that? How proud a lot of those guys were to work under that umbrella. Uh, I had been, uh, I I was hoping that much of what I had seen before was replicated in the best sense of the word. Yeah. And we were, you know, I had intended to go farther. I mean, you know, with, um, with the, whether it's a care and share program for the, our employees picking local charities that they cared about and we matched it and uh, we wanted to make our whole area where we lived much, much better. So, yeah. And it's, uh, well... I'm sure we'll get to it later, but the, the how the company was treated and the, the, the political attack on it is, um, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was fair, and uh, but it is what it is. And for whatever nonsense I had to put up with and have the business smashed, it pales into comparison to the guys that lost their lives or lost their liberty for a period of years because of the politics. But um, good guys have been dying wrongly in wars for as long as people can pick up sticks and throw them at each other, I guess. Yeah, very true. What's going on, Patreon? Join me on Vigilance Elite Patreon for a live video teleconference. So back to college, you graduate Ah, then, no. So I'm in college. I go, uh, um, I go to intern at the White House before Monica Lewinsky makes it popular, right? <laughs> it's for George Bush Sr. And I'm there for about six months, and the guy I'm working for gets fired. So I'm kind of uh, 
also at a dead end. So I end up going to work for a congressman, Dana Rohrbacher, who had been an original speechwriter for Reagan. And I met some great people through that process. And I took two significant trips as an intern. In fact, well, they tried to hire me as the staffer because his his foreign policy guy had been mobilized to go to the Gulf War. A guy became a dear friend, Paul Behrens. But um, my dad said, don't take the job. Don't accept a dollar because it'll put you in Washington, D.C.'s tax bracket. And you do not want to pay taxes there. So I didn't do that. But um, I took two trips. I went to Croatia. Well, actually, it was to Yugoslavia in March of 91, before the war started, and toured all through the areas because there had already been some fighting between Croat and Serbian forces and Slovenian forces. And figured that there was going to be a war there. Uh, and then I went to... Um, Dana Rohrbacher, the congressman, was going to do a um, an expose on communist atrocities during the um, uh, when the Sandinistas took over in the early 80s. And so he sent me and another intern down to Nicaragua to meet a contact there. It was the first time I ever had to shake surveillance because the Sandinistas were still in charge of the police and the military there, even though the government had been uh, in the hands of Violeta Chamorro. But we have to go shake surveillance, or we're off at 4 o'clock in the morning, and and takes us out to this field, and digging away, and sure enough, it's a mass grave. Shattered skulls, arms uh, and legs tied at the waist, or at the wrists, and it was, uh, it was a very sobering moment, a great reminder of, of how bad things can get quickly. And a week later, I got married in Alexandria, Virginia, to uh, a girl I'd met uh, a couple years before, to Joan. And we went on a... Um, that was a great thing about my parents is they really encouraged travel to go see and explore and to do. And so we went uh, on a tour called the Baltic Liberation Tour, which was to Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland. We started in Poland and took a train through those areas, which was still part of the Soviet Union. And you could see it was coming apart. And I remember as we were leaving, you have to put your luggage, we're flying, so the whole tour is leaving, and we're leaving from Tallinn, Estonia to fly to Finland. And one of the, um, one of the guys in our group put his luggage on the scanner, and you could see this bag go through, and it looks like there's a complete manhole cover inside of his bag. Hmm. And this Soviet border guard opens the suitcase and he says, this is a very big problem. It was an entire bronze bust of, of Lenin that had been yanked off a building that our friend had bought on the street and was taking out of the country. Oh. And our buddy said, well, how much to make the problem go away? <laughs> $50. Done. I thought, you know what? If they're letting the bust of Lenin go off of a, a government building for 50 bucks, this place is not going to last long. And sure enough, four months later, the Soviet Union collapsed. Wow. So that was, yeah, that was April that that happened. And, and you know, by August, there was the, the tanks in the front of the parliament there with, with uh, Yeltsin. And the Soviet Union was done. Damn, so you just missed it. Yeah. Wow. So, and then back to Hillsdale for that last year, I applied to OCS and uh, and I got in, and um, yeah, and off to the SEAL teams. I, I finished my last college exam, didn't even go to graduation, and uh, reported to OCS in Newport. Did that for four months. Summer in Newport is pretty nice, and um, and then off to Buds. So, how was Buds for you? It was good. I liked it. I you mean, liked it, was, it. It was hard, certainly, but I went through married, and my wife was a fantastic cook. And um, I'd say the only hard, the hardest part of it was obviously sleep deprivation because my wife, God bless her, she wanted to have a normal social schedule and she'd been teaching at the local Catholic school and she'd have the nuns over all the time. So we'd have nuns in our house for dinner and they'd stay till 10 o'clock at night and I was literally falling asleep in my food. <laughs> <laughs> you know how tired it is. You're, you're going through buds. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So between uh, shining shoes and sharpening knives and polishing uh, you know, your CO2 cartridge and all that stuff you got to do, it was, um, it was good. Did you make it through all at once? Did you get rolled? Or? I made it through, uh, well, yes. First phase, no problem. Second phase, no problem. Third phase, 
I fell off the top of the slide for life. And um, the two guys previous to me that had fallen, one broke his back, one broke his ankle. And uh, I landed on my hip and they immediately hospitalized me for two days, convinced I'd broken something. They finally let me out on a Friday. I wasn't walking very well, but a, uh, I, I found an osteopath in San Diego. And sure enough, he lined up my legs and one leg was about three inches shorter. And he put me in some weird position and snapped the whole thing back into place. And uh, they still tried to roll me back, but at that point I'd passed every run, every swim, everything else to go to San Clemente. And so they, uh, they let me go and I finished on time. Nice. It was good. And then where did you go? Well, back then they had SEAL tactical training. So I went to the East Coast. Well, went to Airborne first and then uh, reported to SEAL Team 8. Got my trident there. We did a short deployment for the Haiti invasion in 94. I came back and as a, as a as an officer, I got to go to sniper school. Oh, really? Which was fantastic. That's rare. Yeah. I'd say dollar for dollar, it was good money spent by the SEAL teams because when I later got out, I really wanted a place, a, lo- a place to go shooting long guns at long range as it was one of the reasons I wanted to build Blackwater. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, so short deployment and then long deployment to, um, on a carrier to the med, to the Middle East, to Bosnia. And well, before that deployment, my father passed away unexpectedly. And, and so then the, the, the pull of trying to help my mom, cause he had a large family business and there was no. There was no plan about what to do next, or there was, you know, I sure there was certainly some indecision about what we should, what the family should do next. And then uh, when I came back from that deployment, my wife was pregnant with our second, and uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer at 29. Wow, which is a, uh, you know, not a, not a not a experience I recommend. Yeah. So, man, that's a lot to deal with it in a short amount of time. Yeah. I got uh, I got remember I got a really bad case of hives for a few days. It was the stress was peaking pretty hard. Yeah. When in your book you talk about a jet showing up and you had con- kind of concealed. I had managed to keep the success of my father pretty much a secret, and I'd say the only nice thing I had was I had a suburban, right? And so guys liked that vehicle, but I didn't have a sports car or anything like that. But yeah, I remember we had been training out in Fallon, doing um, CSAR and um, pilot rescue stuff, and uh, and and also the uh, air to ground strike, air, air to ground work for the uh, the strike aircraft and the carrier. And um, we got, I think we were done training on Thursday, and the NALO aircraft wasn't coming until Monday. So I asked my boss, "Hey, can you know?" There's a, my mom wants me to come back for the weekend. There's a bunch of family stuff after my dad died because this was just like three weeks after he died. He goes, yeah, sure, no problem. We'll see you back there. And uh, a couple of guys from my platoon drove me to this little airport. And I was like, okay, guys, thanks. I got it from here. No, 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 it's okay, Mr. P. We'll, we'll help you in with your bags. And um, and they walk, and there's one of the pilots with this you know, uniform on with a tail number 131 EP, which are my dad's initials, but also my initials. And then that they kind of scratched their heads, and I got a lot of questions the next week after that. I'll bet. Yeah. Were you concerned that they cat was out of the bag at that point? No, not really. I mean, look, they knew who I was. They knew I was the same guy, whether I could retire then or not. That didn't that didn't matter to them. I, I didn't let it matter to them. Okay. So your dad died, and then how how much time was it in between your wife being diagnosed with breast with uh, breast he cancer? He died in March um, of ninety. 95, and a year later, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, less than a year later. And how, how, how long after that did you get out of the SEAL teams? Uh, I got out six months later. Six months later. Yeah, because that actually, uh, I'd already got orders to my next, or, uh, yeah, uh, I got my, assigned to the next platoon, my OIC platoon, and, yeah, I had to undo all that to get out and, sort out the family business. When the doctors have mentioned to your wife that they needed to interrupt the pregnancy and she had 
she didn't want any part of that, it sounded like. Uh, right. That was with our third child. And because she'd had um, all kinds of treatment, but they were really, uh, the doctors were really adamant that she not get pregnant again. And they said, you need to interrupt this pregnant pregnancy. And she said, well, when would I resume it? <laughs> and um, yeah, that was never a question. And, uh, you know, my wife was, was resolute on that. So, How did you feel about that? Were you 100% behind her? Yeah, I supported, uh, absolutely. Not, not all friends and family did, but uh, on the life issue, my, my wife was absolutely resolute. She's a beautiful person. It sounds like it. Yeah. It really does. Wife has breast cancer, new baby, you're out of the SEAL teams, the idea of Blackwater. Yeah, you know, in my experience in working up for those deployments, um, we moved around a lot. And I, so I thought tra training was very fragmented. You're going to Tennessee, Nevada, West Virginia, Virginia, bouncing all over the place, Puerto Rico. And I'd thought a lot about, uh, well, seeing what the SEAL teams, a, a private facility in Tennessee, Mid-South, right? Where the SEAL teams used to go, maybe they still do. And I thought, now someone has to do that on an industrial scale. And um, I was in an unusual position to do that, right? I mean, so in the late 90s, you have this peace dividend and defense cuts and, and they're closing a major base per week across the country. Right, whether it's an Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine base, there was bases closing and ranges closing and all the rest. So this idea of building a private facility was counterintuitive to most. Like every smart financial advisor I ever said said, that's a terrible idea. But build it and they will come. I didn't know anything about development, land development, anything about government contracting, or really anything about business. But a new... I had a pretty good idea that there was a demand and, and that the teams needed something like that. And you go, kind of go back to the well that you know of the people you trust, right? So I hired the two training officers from SEAL Team 8, Ken Vieira and Jim Sorowski. Jim, Jim came later because he wanted to go be a cop after he retired. But um, uh, Ken and a guy named Al Clark and we got uh, Jim Dehart who had, uh, had been the facilities guy at Dev Group. I mean, uh, you know, an unknown secret is that the our first shoot house was built by all the dev group maintenance guys who came out on weekend on the weekends with for pizza and beer, and they welded up one of the largest and still most effective shoot houses in the country. So it was, um, you know, finding land. I wanted to have it within an hour drive of Norfolk to make it easy for people training or living in Norfolk to come and train, do what they have to do, and still make it home in time for their, you know, dinner with their families. And we had to go through all kinds of you know, ass pain with the two counties because one county rejected us, the other county accepted us, Camden accepted us. And so uh, went through all the, the machinations of that and then uh, built it. And actually our first customer was from the West Coast, a West Coast SEAL platoon that came to, uh, to, to Blackwater and we just kind of ground along for the first few years. And it was really our target business that saved the business early on because we had very destructive customers who destroyed everything that we'd ever bought on the outside. And Jim Dehart and uh, a very practical, down-to-earth, I would say solid-state mentality, built these steel targets, which were indestructible. And other customers that came loved them. And so I remember at the end of the fiscal year, one night on September 30 at 11.55 p.m., the fax machine started and out came a, an order from the FBI, oddly enough, to equip like 15 field offices with our target systems. And that, uh, that really kept the lights on at Blackwater for, that, for the year because the training business wasn't strong enough to, to pay the bills. So training and targets kept it going together. And then when Columbine happened, we ended up building a big... Um, a big mock-up uh, of a fighting city. We built it out as a high school, and we it was called Are You Ready High School because you know the, the thing about Columbine is you had all these police departments. Columbine was a was a active shooter incident early in the '90s before, unfortunately, it became a, a more commonplace event. We did all these all these departments, all this nice gear, 
standing around outside and nobody going in to solve the immediate threat. And so I guess our contribution in our own way was to train tens of thousands of SWAT officers from a surround and negotiate mentality to a whoever's there, take a stack of two men or four men or however many you could put together, go move to the sound of the guns and put that fire out. And um, that was, it was the first big volume program we did. Um, our first classified program was for the Coast Guard, oddly enough, teaching them how to shoot drug boat motors out of a, uh, out of a helicopter with a 50 cal, right? Because you had all kinds of drug boats and the helicopters interdict them and they'd say, stop. And they'd say, yeah, fuck off, right? And they would keep going and keep going. And so uh, we taught the Coast Guard how to shoot each of those motors out with a 50 cal so that by the time they were arrested, the drug runners were very happy to be arrested and rescued. Um, and then after, in October of 2000, the USS Cole was blown up. You know, a billion dollar warship that the Navy had optimized to fight at 100 miles, not at 100 meters. It had gotten, the Navy had gotten so risk averse that they were using unloaded weapons, sorry, that they were training only with laser simulators in boot camp anymore because guns were not safe. And the sailors that were guarding the ship that day in Yemen were holding unloaded weapons that they hardly ever fired before. And so the Navy came to us in a hurry after that and said, please put together a, a curriculum, a way for us to train 100,000 sailors how to protect their ships and to retake it if there's an incident. So we did that, and that was our first government contract. How long from breaking ground to first government contract, how long did that take? What time um, well, when I say any, I mean... Look, the first SEAL teams that would come would be a platoon here and a platoon there or maybe an, an A team or a, a Marine platoon or a SWAT team, and they would pay with a credit card. So that'd be a, a twenty five to maybe a $50,000 purchase. Uh, we broke ground in nine, May of 97, about six months after I got out of the Navy. And our first customer was in early 98, and obviously the Navy came about three years later. So yeah, it was lean, find a way to survive for the first two or three years. You know, you have, you have to find a way to become indispensable to your customer. For somebody that claims to not know anything about business, the, it seemed very strategic. The location, close to the SEAL teams on the East Coast, close to Washington, D.C., close to Quantico, at the so my when my father died, um, we sold off the big automotive business, and that had gotten most of the attention for decades. The original business he started made diecast machines, which is a big machine that squeezes a mold, and you shoot in, you inject in at high pressure a molten aluminum or magnesium, and you make a a rim for a car or an engine block or a transmission casing or a gas grill. So he made the machines that did that. And that business had not gotten a lot of love and attention. It was just kind of lumping along. And so I bought up a bunch of the shares from my family and we took that through a lean um, transformation. And I read two books. One was called The Machine That Changed the World, um, which is about the Toyota production system. And the other one was The Goal by Ellie Goldratt. I still remember them. And there are two things about how do you how do you make a manufacturing operation better, more efficient, and make it run with great precision. And so we focused on taking out cost and, and buying smarter and engineering out dumb stuff that had just not kind of always been accepted. And that business had its best year ever in 2000, and we sold it. And so parallel to kind of building Blackwater, I'm doing I'm trying to help a manufacturing business get better. And so when I got to think about Blackwater, it was a training facility. But then as you think, okay, how do you grow beyond that? How do you serve the customer more? What, and I thought, what does a military do, right? It recruits, it vets, it equips, it trains, deploys, and supports people to do a difficult job in a difficult place. So laying out Blackwater, I said, ah, especially when we got our first job, our first overseas job was a security job, which was for, for the agency after 
Um, Your first contract was with the agency? Yeah. I did not know first that. O- first overseas job. First, first time that we deployed anybody anywhere. And early in those days, the, the, the agency's direct, the, the, the director detail had been customers. They came because they liked, we were kind of an all-in-one spot, shoot houses and ranges and space and privacy. And so they came, and so there was a guy named Buzzy Krongard who'd been um, uh, he'd been a one dollar a year advisor to the director, and then he became the executive director because Buzzy in himself had a fantastic life career, all American at Princeton, Marine, CAA case officer, started at Alex Brown in the mailroom, and rose to become the CEO, and had been a knock for the agency his last few years, and. Um, the right kind of guy you want <laughs> near or at the helm of the CIA. And so he'd been helping tenant and because, well, and this ties back to, to who I was working for when I was interning in Congress, right? Dana Rohrbacher knew all the Afghan opposition guys, the, the Northern Alliance, the, the warlords in the North. And he got me to sponsor a peace conference already in Sweet in Switzerland in 1998. Right, so we were trying to get the king then Zahir Shah to return to Afghanistan to have a peace conference. This is long, you know, three years before 9/11. Okay, to have a big conference called the Loya Yirga. The king was too comfortable, sadly, in Rome, and uh, and we couldn't pull it off. But it would have been an amazing, an amazing. Um, Turn of events if we could have prevented 9-11 by, uh, by returning some kind of normalcy to Afghanistan. But anyway, I was in contact with Atanur and uh, Mohakek and Masood and Dostum and, and those kind of people. In fact, Dana Rohrbacher had a meeting with, a, with, a, with Condi Rice, the National Security Advisor, the morning of 9-11, warning, saying, hey, they just killed Masood, Al-Qaeda did, something bad is going to happen. Obviously, the meeting was canceled because the bad thing happened. But between having met Buzzy from his time um, coming to Blackwater, and he asked Gary Jackson, the, the, the president of Blackwater, who owns this place? How did this get here? And he said, well, you should meet Eric. So I had lunch with Buzzy a few times um, early in those days, and uh, he became a, a great friend and mentor. Um, but then when 9-11 happened... I said, Buzzy, anything you need, anything the agency needs, if you need somebody to sweep a floor, I'm your man. Just, we want to help. I think as any American wanted to help. Yeah. Right? And at the same time, the the, the warlords are calling saying, hey, we want to help the USG. Please connect us. So I gave those numbers to Buzzy, and and eventually they, uh, those, maybe they were in touch with them already. I don't know. But, um, we had current cell, cell phone numbers for all those guys in the Northern Alliance that wanted to kill Taliban and kill Al Qaeda, which was a good thing to do at that point. Yeah. So, and then um, I got a call in about late March or April. I'll never forget it because um, I was just sitting down to dinner with the family, and um, the, the a weird number, a blocked, a weird blocked number, rang through on my phone, and I answered it right as we were sitting down to dinner, which I normally wouldn't do, but uh, it was a good call I I, I took. And he said, hey, can you find a bunch of guys like yourself? I said, absolutely. He said, be in my office tomorrow at 9 a.m. And that's what, he had just come back from from a tour of all the agency facilities in Afghanistan and he, um, they needed security, right? Because the U.S. military wouldn't do it. They wanted to do it with 150 people and and we did it with 18 in the first tranche. And that's that's what started that whole process. How many other government contracts did you have? We had, uh, obviously, a lot of training stuff for various soft units, and we were just starting uh, that regular Navy training contract. And the Department of you had wound up getting the Department of State? No. Department of State didn't come for years later. What about Katrina? Well, that was in 2005. So this is 2002 we're talking. Okay. So, yeah. So the business really compounded um, in those years. And the work we did for the agency um, in Afghanistan and then in some other places um, pulled us to Iraq. 
And because of the work we did in Iraq, as DOD was trying to send Paul Bremer or whoever they were going to do to try to the, the coalition provisional authority, they asked the agency, who are you running for security? And that's how we got pulled in to protect Bremer with the first. That was really the only no bid contract that we had. I think it was the first six months was no bid. And, um, and we did that. And um, yeah, it just compounded and we, you know, I, I, there's another early book on business I read on, um, there's, there's, to be successful in business, right? You either have to be super focused on efficiency to drive out every bit of waste, you can be the low cost provider, or you have to be the next, you have to have the next product that everybody wants to buy, right? So I guess the efficiency model would be Walmart, or the product innovation would be the Apple model, or there's the customer intimacy model, right? Where you so become part of your customer's process that they can't do without you, like UPS does with all their logistics and product returns and warranty. And I'd say we focused on, on one and three, being hyper-efficient, applying that Toyota automotive efficiency and discipline to what we did, recruiting, vetting, equipping, training, deploying, and then also serving our customers so well, right? If the contract said do this, well, do this, right? Perform above and beyond. Don't go back to your lawyer for every, every variation. Just serve the customer. And we really prefer doing firm fixed price contracts versus cost plus, right? All the typical Beltway crowd likes to do cost plus because it actually incentivizes them to spin the meter, to make it more expensive because they get to add their fee on top of it. That's why the United States spends more money than the next 17 countries combined. It's terrible, right? I preferred to run the business and every chance we had, we'd do firm fixed price. And then the, then the discipline and the risk is on us, whether it's providing an aircraft or whatever. And um, well, aside from the politics, the, the operators, the people we served in the field were damn happy with us. Yeah. How fast was it growing at this point once you picked up the CIA contract? Huh. Our revenue, I remember, went from, well, the first year's revenue was 400,000. Second year was 800. And then a million two, and then a million six. And then it went to 12 million, uh, 35, 160, 400. I mean, so there was a few years it just, it really rocked, rocketed. And so that's a, that kind of growth also causes enormous stress to an organization, right? There's cash management, there's people, there's all the rest. But we had a, we'd built a pretty good engine which could process, right? And so uh, 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 go again, going back to the well that you know, I hired more guys that I went to buds with. <laughs> Bill Matthews, Chris Burgess, Jeff Gibson, um, guys I had served in the teams with, and because there was a known quantity, and in those cases, they'd been off to law school or gotten MBAs and worked in other ports of corporate America. So they kind of know what that expectation was and they brought that, they brought a soft mentality to a corporation, and that was the merge. And uh, we had a we had a very, very capable organization. I would I would put our management team up against any management team in the country. We could punch way above our weight. At the height, at the height of Blackwater, there's rumors that you had more spec operators under the Blackwater umbrella than the United States military had at active duty. Is no, there any truth to we that? Had probably, it would probably be more in our database, meaning we could have deployed them, but but no. I mean, no. Look, the SF Command has ten or 20,000 Green Berets. We, we are, you know, the Ranger Regiment is a few thousand, so we didn't exceed, you know, we didn't exceed that number by any means, but we had a, uh, a pretty capable, potent, vertically integrated process that we could recruit, we could vet, we could train, we could equip. And and the only acquisition that we actually made as a company was an air operation. And that happened in 2003. 
uh, with Richard Pear, Tim Childry, and the guys from Presidential Airways. And they had it was six, they had a team of six and two leased Casas, right? And a Casa 212 is like a little shrunk C-130. Um, and we bought them. Uh, we bought the business. And it was a fantastic fit. And they, they came from the Night Stalkers, right? They came from a TF-160... Army Special Aviation, Army Special Operations Aviation mentality. And so their culture fit perfectly with ours. And uh, away we went. And those guys carried right over. Yeah. Best pilots in the world. And we and I built them their own hangar. I built them their own runway on the compound. Well, yes, I built them a proper runway because I'd been, remember I'd been a pilot since I was a little kid. And I was making that weekly commute from Northern Virginia down to the Blackwater compound, which was 242 miles each way. And uh, so I bought a little bush plane early on and uh, I would fly that down. So we ended up scraping off uh, a few of the, uh, the, some of the berm, the last part of the uh, KD range. Um, and so that was the original Blackwater runway was the back half of the KD range. And, uh, and then we built a proper concrete one. But I even landed on that KD range at night and uh, used an old uh, missionary or a bush trick with, uh, made, a, uh, made our, my own um, um, uh, VASI, right? A vertical approach slope indicator to know uh, to how to line up and get on the right glide slope and, and land fully blacked out. I just have Tony, the facility manager sitting at the end of the runway with the, with the brake lights on so I know where the end of the runway was. <laughs> nice, nice. But then, so yes, so I had, the, I guess, the first Blackwater aircraft with that, but, um, but then when uh, Richard and the boys came on board, it was a proper Part 135, Part 145 uh, operation, and it grew to 73 aircraft um, that we... Owned and operated in all the garden spots, so ranging from a light strike aircraft like a Super Decano all the way to a 767. So, how were the how hard was it to recruit guys to get in there? And I mean, because it was growing so fast, and I was in the SEAL teams when I believe Blackwater was at its prime, 2005, 2006. Yeah, time frame. Those are busy years. And the rumors, not really rumors, but the word going around the team was, uh, you know, a lot of guys were still going to UCOM. A lot of guys weren't doing exactly what they joined the SEAL teams to do right. or SF units to do. And word got around that, hey, you're going to go, you're going to go over there. You're probably going to see some action. You're going to get paid three or four times what you're getting paid here. And so it, it seemed like, and I had a lot of friends that got out and jumped. They left the SEAL teams just to go to work for you. They, there was a lot of guys that left, but when they do the analysis, there was not a, a higher departure rate than normal. But instead of guys going off to school or going off to another job, yes, they came to work for companies like us. But at the same time, right, the the Navy came to us and said, "How?" because we were already doing training on their firearms and tactics side, but they said, how are you able to recruit the right people to do this job? I said, well, why do people rob banks? It's where the money is, right? So if you want to find the right next SEAL, EOD, diver, boat crewman, whatever, go to the places that those are more likely to be. And so we actually put together a mentor program to take former SEALs that looked the part to go to the Bud Light Triathlon Series or like the Wyoming State Wrestling Championships. Like the Wyoming Montana wrestler at the state level were the most likely to make it through Buds in the first pass, statistically, right? They kind of a, an early attempt at big data, yeah. <laughs> finding, finding the right candidates. And so by doing that, we are able to, to fill the pipeline with a lot of qualified candidates to, to make it through and to increase the, the throughput of BUDS without changing the standards. You were a part of that? We built that program. Wow. I had no idea. Yeah. That was a Blackwater contract with our mentors all over the country. And there's still a version of that still functioning. 
Interesting. Yeah. So, but again, applying, we were a private company. We had a contract. We had to put so many people with so many qualifications in that job. So we had to offer competitive pay. We couldn't waste their time. We couldn't, we can't press gang them, right? We can't stop loss them. So it is truly a volunteer program. And so you have to take care of them and respect them and, you know, and so we wanted guys that would work hard for us and they want to go see their families. And so we wouldn't belabor the point of by the time they leave the field where they're home again and they, and they do it in, in, in digestible enough chunks, right? As you know, you deployed 60 days, 90 days, but then, you know, you leave Baghdad and you're, you're back in the, in the arms of your wife within a day and a half. Yeah. Um, the, there's a, there's a misconception about our pay versus what active duty was getting paid. If you compare apples to apples of what total compensation was, yes, our apparent cash compensation was much higher. But when you look at all the other allowances, housing allowances, base, um, 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 the exchange, the insurance, uh, all the other stuff, our pay was comparable, but not higher to what an active duty seal would be getting. But it's just the apparent upfront cash was much more visible. Yeah, it definitely definitely was how long was it before you started seeing all these other competitors pop up like triple canopy mvm dying were they were you you were first right? no dying had don't dying was kind of the established um state department contractor they'd been doing all that service stuff uh to to that kind of that ex- in, in, in installed customer base but as the afghan issue flared and then Iraq flared it so outstripped their ability to grow and I would characterize Dyncor as a very typical Beltway run company and um, quite bureaucratic and quite perfect for the State Department and when the I would say very urgent and very compelling needs for more security Right, because it was on. It was dangerous times in Baghdad when all that, you know, when they started asking for it. I mean, we we were contacted originally by the DoD after the senior UN diplomat in Baghdad had been blown up the summer of 2003. Right, they blew him up with a truck bomb inside of a concrete mixer. It was like a 2,000 pounder. Wow. And so all the people in Washington said, "Okay, it's real now." And I remember we had immediately had two people that went out with Bremer, and his original detail was from um, some National Guard unit. And they just hadn't really had the training or the, uh, the equipment or the, the wherewithal to, to accomplish that mission. And the Secret Service came out because they thought they were going to assign the Secret Service to do that mission. And they have no way are they, you know, the, the Secret Service mentality is they can shut down everything around their protectee and create a huge bubble um, and just lock down entire roads, entire routes, and they just own it all. But you can't really do that in an active war zone. And so you had to have a bubble that could move and flex and, and, and go with it. So between the, the ground element and the aviation element, uh, they no, no federal agency wanted to touch it. And so the State Department turned to us, and we did it. So, one of the one of the fascinating things about you that that that, that I find is you don't mind getting your hands dirty. And so when the when the CIA contract was starting up, you were out there on the ground running operations, correct? Yeah, it was one of the first eighteen. Yeah, and do you want to talk a little bit about that? What that was like being it's your company, your on the ground running missions and, and I look it was a great honor that they turned to us because it was a very important mission right because the CIA is the ones who made that victory possible for the United States right and let me digress a minute and say and this this goes in keeping with what I've been saying for the last 10 years at least after 9/11 while the Pentagon was still smoldering right Bush goes to meet with his National Security Cabinet at Camp David. And the Pentagon, you know what their best option was to go to Afghanistan? They wanted to do bombs, missiles, 
in a ranger raid, and they wanted to wait six months until the following April and do a conventional mechanized invasion of Afghanistan via Pakistan. That is what the United States military came with, the most expensive military on the planet. It was the agency, it was Colfer Black and his team. Colfer was the head of the counterterrorism center. And because of his experience doing unconventional warfare, hybrid warfare against Soviet targets in Libya and Chad and Angola and the DRC in the 80s, he said, Mr. President, give us the authorities and a billion dollars and in three weeks, the flies will be walking on the eyeballs of our enemies, right? So U.S., the and obviously Bush made the right decision and said, okay, we're doing that. That's why we had such a lightning victory in Afghanistan. It was 100 soft guys and agency guys let off, carnivores let off leash, backed by air power, and they smashed the hell out of the Taliban, and the Taliban and al-Qaeda were truly running for their lives. And that worked for six, eight months, until Bagram became a saluting zone, and you had all the conventional officers show up, okay? no With the, the no-beard policy, starch camis goes into effect. We repeated that same failure for 19 and a half years. If they'd kept it small, if Bush had the discipline and the foresight to say, no, Pentagon, you don't get to go play now, leave this to, to that, we're not doing nation building, but we will play whack-a-mole severely, the Afghans would have understood that. And it would be vastly better there today than be <laughs> it is truly a terror sanctuary. Again, you have the Haqqanis that have high bounty, they're high bounty terrorists now running the Afghan government. Is the interior minister. Did you enjoy running Blackwater as a CEO more or running operations under the CIA contract? Both. Both? Sure. It was a macro and a micro. How were you doing that simultaneously? Um, the management team of Blackwater was spectacular, right? So I might be the, the guy that put the money up that put Black, made Blackwater possible, but it was Gary Jackson and Danielle Morrison and Bill Matthews and Chris Burgess and Jeff Gibson and all that team that made it run. And they and, I, and there's a hundred other names I should list, but they ran the business. And there was a reason, right? The normal Beltway thing would be, um, first of all, nobody had invested in a training facility, right? Like the Dine Corps, everybody would have a security contract for the government and they'd try to rent this range over here or this track and they'd have to send medical over here and all the rest. And so in keeping with what I was talking about with a lean progression, right? Recruit, vet, equip, train, deploy. Blackwater was designed to be a machine with everything in house, literally within walking distance. And so you hopefully you experienced that when you were recruited, the training, the equipment, the medical, all was pretty damn close to each other, Yeah. right? So we didn't lose days or weeks moving people through that process. And so that management team was able to um, efficiently produce a product, meaning a trained and equipped guy to go do something, or an aircraft that could do XYZ job, or a construction crew to do something. They did that in a concise, organized, disciplined way, vertically integrated. It's just... I still don't, I just don't understand how, I mean, because those are some intricate operations yeah. that we're doing out there. And, and, and we, but we doing. recruited from people that had done intricate operations. I remember I flew over um, the first, I flew over on the one time the USG provided airlift for us to send aircraft to Iraq was the first time. And uh, so we got our birds, our little birds, that were going to go do the protection for then Bremer. We loaded them in Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, flew over up in the, the top deck of the C-5 with the guys. And um, we land at like 2 o'clock in the morning after the, the blacked-out approach into Baghdad, and the guys are offloading the stuff. And a bunch of them were TF-160 veterans, many of whom had been at Black Hawk Down, 
just 10 years before in their career. And they said, Mr. P, thanks so much for giving us the opportunity to do this again. This is what we're good at. Wow. And that, that was the great thing about starting, running, whatever, Blackwater, is giving people that were really good, right? The Michael Jordans of their skill set, giving them a chance to do that again. So they get to work with people they like to work with. They're paid well for their job and the risks that they take. They're given the right equipment in a no bullshit environment. That's that was my goal at BW. Worked. <clears throat> at the at the high point, the, the absolute peak of Blackwater, how many contracts did you have and what agencies were they with? I don't know about the total contracts number, but it was everything from well, we'll go by by buckets of, of stuff. Train and equip advisory work for Afghan Army, Iraqi Security Forces, and a host of other friendly partner nations around the world. So, and there's train advisory, everything from like bodyguard training to um, to sniper to every kind of law enforcement or military special operations unit, up to including company and battalion size infantry operations, even artillery. On the air side, we did that as well, like soft aviation capacity building. So teaching teaching partner nations to fly on night vision goggles and do, you know, night shipboarding or night insert of a team by by goggles or by fast rope. Um, obviously security is what the company got um, known for and recognized for. And that was a uh, big driver of revenue and sadly a big driver of problems. You know, one of my biggest regrets is ever going to work for the State Department because I just didn't think they appreciated the work that we did for them. And so if I'd said no, the company would still be uh, going and flourishing and, and carrying on. And, and maybe the maybe State Department is, is more, maybe DynCorp is a better vendor for them. I can understand that. Yeah. So... At peak, we probably had 3,500. 3,500 people deployed. People yeah. deployed. 3,000, 3,500. That's between Iraq, Afghanistan, aviation. And this also includes, we had for Hurricane Katrina, we had about 700 guys deployed for about a year. What were you guys doing down there? So we never had any plan ever to be in the domestic security business to do anything like that inside of America. But <laughs> I remember I was actually doing a surveillance exercise for that other team I was doing, right? The last chapter in my book. And uh, I had the radio on and I was talking about, well, and I'd been in South Florida when Hurricane Katrina went over South Florida. So I'd still been there. And then up the, the, the hurricane still rolled and it smacked the uh, you know New Orleans area. Um. And we were just taking delivery of a Puma, a big helicopter, a little bit bigger than a Black Hawk. And I remember calling our air boss, Richard Pear. I said, hey, put the, put the air crew to bed, reset their crew rest, and as soon as they can in the morning, fly to New Orleans. It was just figured out. And sure enough, they started flying. And one of our management staff had been in a Harvard course, a Harvard executive course, with some senior guy from the Coast Guard. So he literally reached across the hall, uh, uh, across the aisle of his classroom and said, hey, we got a helicopter. We can help you guys out in New Orleans. Roger. So November 505, our helicopter became Coast Guard 505 by the time they made it to New Orleans. And they evac 128 people. And again, it was a great case of, of putting the right people with the right attitude with an objective, right? It was, it was, uh, was objective-based leadership. Our goal is to go help and make good things happen. And so they did. And um, But then after um, they were working for a few days, all the Coast Guard provided us was fuel. We, you know, we, we sent that gratis. Um, they moved a bunch of people. Our Casas were flying a bunch of stuff down from, um, from Moyoc. And then uh, the private sector started calling, right? Walmart, Bell South, insurance companies because there had been a total breakdown of, of law and order and chaos 
And so we ended up surging 145 guys from 36, uh, from six states away. Um, we did it in about 36 hours. We beat the Louisiana National Guard into the French Quarter. Incredible. Our guys arrived and found bodies in the streets, not from the storm, but from violence from looting. And so, yes, our guys went armed and, um, you know, full on body armor because they were even shooting at aircraft. But um, within a couple of days, the, the plates came off and it was just down to, uh, to sidearms. But then FEMA... So you were able to get back to law and order within a few days of just being down there with 145 guys. Well, yeah. So we weren't we weren't there to we were there to to secure specific objectives. Right? Okay. Like Walmart called cuz I think they had like five or eight stores looted, picked clean, and they had a central distribution facility was going to be next. And so in that case, we dropped like a commando team, <laughs> meaning they had we dropped them off with food, water, satcom, and uh, rules of engagement, right? And a copy of our quickly um, uh, licensed Louisiana private security and um, investigations firm, right? So we went there with the right licenses, and they they go and the guys just sat there and prevented any looters, right? Because looting only happens when people knock on the door and nothing happens, and you call nine one one and nothing happens, and and they go. So then FEMA came to us. All right, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which was tasked to stabilize this whole debacle. And they, because they'd contacted the Federal Protective Service, which is this federal police force as part of DHS. And they were supposed to send down hundreds and hundreds of police officers, federal police officers, to secure all these areas. And their employee union said, no, the conditions were too rough and too unsafe, they wouldn't go. So FEMA asked if we could do it. And we said, uh, okay, sure, right? Because our default answer was yes, and we're going to figure it out how to make something happen. And so, yes, but then the, you know, the, the number became 700 quickly, but we had to provide all the life support, all the logistics support. And, and I'm so proud, yet again, of the team that just figured this out. Because at that point, between Iraq and Afghanistan, every kind of military tent was on back order for years. So what did they do? Well, they went and bought circus tents. And they put them up in various parking lots. Jim Dehart and his crew of maintenance guys took car trailers, okay, and, and put in shower and sanitation facilities inside that with uh, water treatment. And we just figured it out how to support guys in the field. And they ended up buying an RV and put a VSAT antenna uh, satellite system on the top of it so that became the mobile pay wagon in office which could visit all these sites and it was uh it was not the perfect solution but it was a damn a damn bit better than nothing wow how and that all that was stood up how fast days and and we had and, and you know what we had no plans again there was no prior staging an organization to say, let's have a domestic response force ready for... No, nothing like that. Basically, for the first 145 guys, we could pull inventory off the warehouse of what we would do to provide contractors with, you know, a radio or a firearm or body armor or whatever it is. We just kind of cobbled it together. Incredible. How, how long were you guys down there? I think we were there for three years. Three years? Yeah, at least two. But it was it was far longer than than we ever thought necessary. So it got cleaned up in a couple of days, and then they kept it. They kept black well, yeah, because there was a lot of. I mean, it was almost like refugee camps, morgue, cash distribution offices. There was a lot of things that needed security because it far outstripped local law enforcement's ability to to handle it. So. Did you did Blackwater ever work in that capacity anywhere else in the U.S.? No. Um, no. <laughs> we had one. There was one other good story that came out of that that evacuation because we were actually contacted by Bill Gates' office, <laughs> who had they had lost touch. Right, I think like Melinda Gates' sister lived along the Gulf Coast, and. Phones were down, 
no SATCOM, no nothing. And so a former CIA associate of ours had been working at that office, and he called us and said, hey, could you send somebody to just go, A, make contact, and bring them supplies to see what's up? Check. So the guys loaded up an ATV with a trailer inside of a casa, and they flew to an airfield, which was actually closed, right, because of all the storm damage. And I think they ended landed short on a damage runway or they land on a taxiway. And off they go, miles and miles away from their destination because it's as close as they could get. So they go overland, chainsaws, cutting down trees as they go to this specific address. Knock on the door. Hey, we're from Blackwater. Gates family sent us. Here's a SATCOM. Call them. Dropped off generator, food, fuel, medicine, left, mission complete, off they go, back in the casa, back to Virginia, back to North Carolina. We ended up with a nice ATV out of that, but uh, you know, the, the, the Gates job paid for the ATV. <laughs> nice. But it was a good, it was, a, it was a, an example of you give the right people uh, with a clear mission, an objective-based, right? Get to them, like, like that... Like that thing you hopefully read in the military somewhere, the, the message to Garcia, right? When, when the U.S. had to get a message to Garcia, who was somewhere in the hills of Cuba, right, to organize some kind of resistance against the Spanish. They just sent a guy to say, your job is to get a message to Garcia. It's not to ask me 10 steps of what to do. Get it there. Make it happen. Blackwater was good at making it happen. Yeah. Cool. Which is... In this day and age of, of bureaucracy and the foreign policy establishment in, in, a, in, in Washington, they're not very good at making good things happen. Yeah. i got to be honest. It seems like the common denominator here, or maybe the motto of Blackwater, should be efficiency. Uh, not even efficiency, but uh, I would say um, um, a real uh, a desire to get a mission done. What is the mission? We'll, we'll find a way to make it work. One last question, then we'll take a quick break. But what you've built up to this point is just, it's indescribable. And I want to know where your drive comes from, because I do know, back to your family and the success of your dad, he said, you're not getting anything until you're 30. You can't be a part of this until you're 30. You got through the SEAL teams, came home, and uh, or, or at some point my timeline might be uh, a little off here, but uh, that kind of went away after you became a SEAL. So you didn't have to do all this. What was the driving factor? It was a uh, great... Um, look, I'm a patriot. Uh, I love America. Um, the, the U.S. government, the U.S. military needed our help. And we were honored to help in any way we could. And working with the people was great, with our people, right? And and it was, uh, you know, the, I, I would, I like to think that working with the BW crew was like working with the best elements of a soft unit. So people are not, they're not thinking, you know, they're not, they're not at four o'clock and they're not looking for the door at the end of the day. Yeah. If it's, you know. Um, <laughs> Seven to seven is a half day, right? Everybody wants to get the job done there. Yeah. I mean, everything was, uh, it was competitive. It was, people like to run hard. We, we, as a company, we didn't do golf outings. We didn't do that kind of team building stuff. We did 12 and 24 hour adventure races, the whole management team. And um, and, I, and I we kind of picked those kind of races, not triathlons, because that's just an endurance exercise, but having to make decisions in an adventure race where you have to navigate and you have to make um, incomplete, you have to make decisions based on incomplete information and live with the consequences was very analogous to our life and to our business life. Fair enough. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. Giddy up. It took me to make it my most vulnerable point in my entire life. For context of where the substance comes from, it comes from the the back of a Sonoran desert toad. These are the two 
toxic glands right here behind the eyes. The Sonoran Desert Toad, native to Arizona, and it holds a reputation. This toad is the second most toxic toad in the world. That was so powerful. I, I can't imagine people not having a breakthrough. This substance does bring you to almost like a heavenly state. The price to pay is in order to get there, you have to die. Like a part of you needs to go away for you to experience that thing that might always be there, but there's a barrier between it. You have to trust that it's gonna be okay. You know, I, I think 5-MeO is really, really like the red pill from the Matrix. first thing, after all the anxiety and all of that got sucked out of me, the first thing that I heard was, I swear, it was the Earth's vibration. I journaled the entire thing, and I'm putting it in an envelope, and when my son, when things get too spun out of control for him, I want them to read what I wrote. I want to tell you all about this badass company I just found called Bubs Naturals. Bubs Naturals is a tribute company to Navy SEAL, CIA contractor, and former colleague of mine, Glenn, call sign Bubs Doherty, who laid his life down saving Americans in Benghazi, Libya. Glenn was one hell of a guy. He was best friends to hundreds of people, to include ski bums, outdoor enthusiasts, Navy SEALs, Pretty much everybody in between, and yes, even the hippies. In fact, Glenn made such an impact on people that his best childhood friend and owner of the company, Sean, not me, a different Sean, donates 10% of all proceeds to the Glenn Doherty Foundation. And on Veterans Day, he donates 100% of proceeds to the Glenn Doherty Foundation. So I got into a discussion with Sean, the owner of Bubs, and he says to me, he says, Sean, I want you to try our collagen. It's good for joint health, muscle recovery, and this is my favorite part. He claims you will take the best shit of your life after trying their collagen. So I'm trying it. Not only that, it also has 20 grams of protein and seven essential amino acids in one single ingredient. You put it in your coffee, you take it every morning, and you stay sharp. So if you're like me and you want to keep your joints healthy, get better muscle recovery, work on your gut health, have beautiful hair, skin, and nails, and take literally the best shit of your life, go to bubsnaturals.com. Use the promo code SEAN for 20% off. That's bubsnaturals.com. Use the discount code SEAN, that's S-H-A-W-N, for 20% off. All right, so we're back from the break, and I want to go into some of the, the incidents that got major press and probably what led to the government vilif vilifying you. And I'd like to start with March 31st, Fallujah. Okay. <clears throat> so that was March 31st, 2004. So that's about um, eight, nine months after the U.S. originally invades Iraq. And we had... I'd actually been to that area just three weeks before it happened. And we had uh, four guys that were just escorting some trucks to go move some food equipment. That's all it was. It was nothing more elaborate or exotic than that. <clears throat> and they uh, had met with the, the supposed to be the, the, the reliable, trusted Iraqis to give them guidance about where to go. And... You know, these are, remember the areas of Fallujah and Ramadi had heavy fighting after that because they'd never really been pacified. They'd never really been cleaned out. 
right? The maneuver warfare lightning approach of the U.S. invasion in 2003 bypassed many of those spots of hot resistance. And Fallujah and Ramadi were where a lot of, uh, it was effectively an, an, an Iraqi Republican Guard retirement area, right? So there was a, a real hotbed of people that were not happy. And the guys were um, basically led into an ambush and um, they were shot up immediately and their bodies desecrated, you know, the terrible scenes of them being dragged through the streets and hung from the bridge. It was all done for uh, the propaganda effect to try to terrorize the U.S. Um, presence in the country. And I'll never forget it. Um, like I said, I'd been there. I, I knew some of those guys. Like, I'd been with Zabko every day for 10 days prior to that happening. <clears throat> and I actually went, and because I knew him, I, uh, I immediately flew to do the notification for his family in uh, Cleveland, Ohio that night. And Gary went and took care of um, um, one of the, the, the SEAL um, uh, that was lost. And one of our aviators went and took care of Mike Teague. And so it was, it was personal for all of us. We, we never, I never lost anyone under my command or authority when I was in the SEAL teams. And this was the first for us as a company. And it was, um, you know, early in the Iraq days, it was, went from quite peaceful after the initial shock to the, the insurgency kind of exploded. Um, March 31, are those guys are ambushed in Fallujah. Three days later, our guys are ambushed on the road between Baghdad and the airport. And at least two or three of our guys are killed. And one of them put on a, a, a literally a Navy Cross level performance, which saved them. And, and then like by the 4th of April in Fallujah, sorry, in Najaf, right? You have a thousand plus Shia militiamen attacking a coalition facility and they initiated attack by attacking, by taking a Colombian soldier, stuffing a grenade in his mouth and pulling the pin. That's how they did that. Yeah. Okay. So it, it was on and we had eight, we, we were not supposed to be protecting the facility down in Najaf. We had, um, we had eight guys there providing PSD support for the lead diplomat that was there. And that's it. But between, and I'll never forget that phone call I got at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And it was our air boss, Richard Pear, saying, Hey, boss, um, our guys are, are in it, and they're surrounded, and they're running out of ammo. And we'd like to send the Little Birds. I said, Of course, send them. He says, But remember, we're not insured. Right, because three weeks before the um, uh, there was a DHL cargo jet that had been shot down by a missile flying out of Baghdad, and their insurer was our insurer, who promptly told us, "Hey, uh, we're canceling your insurance policy. Um, we were on a firm fixed price contract, so I couldn't just say, oh, by the way, I'm going to add another million and a half dollars to our insurance policy to our charge and and buy insurance." No, so they canceled it. So the aircraft were self-insured by me. If they were shot down, I had to replace it, you know, within days to have it going again. So he was to tell, calling to tell me to say, "Hey, it, it's on us, or it's on me. <laughs> we're sending these aircraft. Um, if it's okay with you, I said absolutely." And so off they go. And again, the right people with the right experience and the right mission. The TF-160 guys had already taking it upon themselves to have a cache of heavy weapons ready to go, staged right there next to the ramp so that when the alarm bell went up, there was no drama. They lure out the birds, ask for volunteers, down go the three helicopters and um, evacuated a, um, a Marine who had been shot through. I think the Marine Corps gave him a silver star and bronze stars to a bunch of the other soldiers that day. And the... The DOD didn't give any of our guys awards. We gave them awards, but that's that also kind of started our tradition of presenting awards to our guys that, that went above and beyond the, the call of duty. I remember we um, we ended up coining a medal 
<clears throat> and it was an image of uh, St. Michael the Archangel with a sword stepping on a demon. And uh, on the top of it just said Servium, right? Servium is the Latin word for I will serve. Because their guys were ultimately volunteers. What was going through your head on March 31st, 2004? And when did you see that? Um, I'd gotten phone calls that they were missing. That we had a, a team that was not accounted for and were missing. And then when the, the video came in of a Mitsubishi Pajero, Pajero on fire, then it was, yeah, we knew it was bad. It's a, that is the ultimate gut punch. Yeah. You just, it's, it's awful. And then to fly to see his parents. Remember I told his brother and sister-in-law first, and then his parents came to their house. And um, we had a, a connection with the U.S. Marshal, so I had a Marshal come with me. And he just waited outside just so I guess the people knew it was, a, it was an official thing. But, um, yeah, just terrible. Were those bodies ever recovered? Yes. Thanks God to the Marine Corps. Good. Moving into the incident, which undoubtedly was the downturn of Blackwater, 2007, Nassau Square. Yep. What's your take? Well, look, the... Um, the Iraq War was a maelstrom of conflicting forces, right? You had angry Sunnis, you had angry Shia, you had constant Iranian presence at the IRGC and the Quds Forces, the Iranians, uh, special, special units were very, very active in the country, um, stirring up hate and discontent to make it impossible or difficult for the U.S. to stay. And... You know, for people that think it's all peace, love, and happiness in Baghdad at that time, that this that our guys just started shooting willy-nilly, unprovoked, and all the rest, it had been a very dangerous week for us just in the seven days prior, right? We had uh, another convoy of guys that got ambushed and shot up on the Baghdad Highway, uh, another one that had been hit by an EFP, right? An EFP is an explosive form penetrator. It's a, a copper plate in front of a... Uh, a coffee can full of explosives, and when you initiate that, the explosive goes off at 22,000 feet per second, turns that copper plate into a slug of copper going 8,000 feet per second and bored right through their armored vehicle. Fortunately, it didn't kill any of our guys that time, but it sent them to the hospital. Uh, we had a helicopter shot down just days before that, and then the day of Nisra Square, a car bomb goes off where... We had a team. It went outside. Of, it went off outside of a venue where he had a team um, protecting a U.S. AID official, and instead of hard pointing at that facility, um, which they normally would, all the Iraqis had run away, so they decided to move. And so, you know, in the in the chaos that follows, Raven Twenty Three, one of the teams, is called, and I'm, I'm not going to try to redescribe the the masterful description you did sitting down with those guys but to su suffice it to say that traffic circles in Baghdad are like the trail intersections if you're hunting deer right if you're a deer hunter and if, or if you're an insurgent trying to hunt Americans you hunt the traffic circles and so they go to block the traffic and um, uh, some traffic doesn't stop and, uh, and and shooting entails what I can tell you though <clears throat> is how badly the Iranians wanted the U.S. out, and how badly they wanted Blackwater out of Iraq. Um, in 2004 already, early, the head of the Iraqi intelligence service came to me, a fantastic guy named Mohammed Shawani. That's another guy you should interview here. Okay? A true Iraqi patriot and a great warrior. And he... Um, he said, he came with his agency handler and said, the Iranians are setting up all kinds of direct action, cash offices, political influence operations. They're doing in Iraq what they did in Lebanon with Hezbollah to exert control. And we, the Iraqi government, we, the Iraqi intelligence service, want to stop it. So please put a program together to help us do that. 
And so he priced the whole thing up, gave it to them. They loved it. The agency was going to fund it. And it was stopped by Condi Rice in the NSC. No, the Iranians are not our enemy. We have to let the Iraqi political process play out, all the rest. I think that's a real sliding door moment in the history of Iraq. Because if we had severed those talons of Iran sinking their hooks into the Iraqi state, things would be very, very different in Iraq right now. So they hated us. Look, still to this day, I've been denounced in person, or I've been denounced by name twice by the Supreme Leader of Iran. Probably why they put me on their sanction and hit list. Yeah. Up to that point, though, it's my understanding Blackwater had a, a phenomenal reputation. Yeah. Correct? I, look, we did. I mean, look, any any time in terms of use of force versus total total missions run, it was it was tiny. I think our guys used uh, used firearms less than one tenth of one percent of all those missions, right? And so this is in a war zone, in an area where people are shooting, uh, insurgents are attacking Americans, and you're kind of carrying the most, uh, I would call it Al Jazeera worthy targets, right? If they could kill a diplomat, it makes uh, a huge splash for uh, for the enemy. The other problem we faced is every convoy, every PSD was considered a Blackwater convoy. Yeah. And so we had dozens of, of, of times per week where someone would call and say, ah, you see these Blackwater guys are doing something bad in Basra. Uh, we don't have anybody in Basra. Or so we, you know, we literally put trackers on all the vehicles to help delineate where our guys were versus anybody else. And as a company, for the non-State Department work that we did, we put cameras on all the vehicles. We had asked specifically from the State Department to put via, to put cameras like a like a cruiser cam, like a police officer has a in, a, in the dash cam in his car, to put those in all our vehicles to keep to take away the he said she said claims of these disputes. And we had a number of times where if our guys were in a in a shooting event outside of the State Department stuff, where the DOD would come and check the tapes and they say, "Yep, no problem. That's a absolutely justified shooting." If we had had those cameras on the vehicles that day, I don't think the whole debacle of Nisra Square for the guy for the Raven 23 guys ever would have happened. So you think that whole p- political agenda to Look, smear the, the, the anti-war left in the Vietnam War went after troops. Mm-hmm. And this time they went after contractors. And sadly, a Blackwater represented everything they loved to hate. I represented everything they loved to hate. I was a white male, married to a woman, Roman Catholic, with a bunch of kids. I was a sole owner of the business. I never tried to, to make the business about me or personalize it, but I was the sole owner. And I didn't have a whole board of former generals or former connected DC people. It was, it was run with a pretty simple chain of command. We never paid lobbyists. We didn't have the whole DC apparatchik footprint that is the norm in Washington. And that was our undoing. Look, we focused on doing a great job for the US government in the most difficult places, in the most dangerous places, without excuses. And it turns out, like Bill Donovan said in his book, right, the founder of the OSS, of all the enemies he faced, the Imperial Japanese Army, the Nazis, the Soviets, the most dangerous enemies he faced were in Washington, D.C. The State Department, the FBI, and the War Department. Some things don't change in Washington. <clears throat> There's a lot of speculation whether it was the Status Forces Agreement that was uh, the major agenda behind it, or uh, I know there was some oil contracts going on at that time. <sighs> uh, it, it, the Iranian influence. Do not ever discount the Iranian influence on the Biden-Obama administration then, as there is now. Why was the Obama team so quick to get in bed with the Iranians and literally send them pallets of cash and make a make a bad nuclear deal with them? Why do they so badly want to do something with the Iranians now again? I don't know. They have a, a misplaced trust in the mullahs. Do you have any more insight on that? On, on how... On, 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 on the how Iranians. Look, all I know is that there was uh, 
There is other surveillance video. There's other stuff that I've, I've been told is out there that we're never able to get our hands on that would have been very clear that showed a lot of muzzle flashes, um, you know. Oh, they deleted the drone footage. Yeah. What I, what I, mean, I meant was... I mean, look, even when it says, wow, these guys weren't shot at, and why was that vehicle disabled? Look, they pulled an AK round out of the radiator. The FBI did, right? And and when you, when you hit a radiator and the coolant drains out... Unfortunately, with a modern electronic engine, no coolant, the engine shuts itself off to preserve itself. In this case, we would have taken a damaged engine that could have driven off, even if it could have moved a quarter mile, to move off that X. But uh, that's part of the unfortunateness of it all. What I was referring to is the Iranian influence or the uh, being in cahoots with the administration. I don't know if it's in cahoots, but... <sighs> Sadly, that could be true. I'm not saying it's not true, but the the Iranians are a very deliberate society. Remember, the Persian society is old and ancient, and and you know they put a thousand stitches in a rug into a square inch. So, their after their experience of the Iran Iraq War, they wanted to make sure that Iraq as a state would never be unified or strong enough to threaten them ever again, and so. They got their hooks in. They have built their Shia militias, right? It's called the Hashtashabi. They're really the ones, it's, this, it's the Shia Iranian overreach in Iraq that made ISIS an inevitability. And still to this day, there are Hashtashabi units paid for by the Iraqi government using U.S. provided equipment that are under the leadership of Iranian IRGC Quds Force officers. So the U.S. gets rolled, the U.S. plays checkers, the Iranians are playing chess. And because we have a, a national security apparatus that doesn't want to do what it takes to push them back. When that incident happened and you heard about it, do you have any idea what that was going to turn into? I got a call um, already an hour after the incident by the country manager. He goes, hey boss, there was a firefight and there's a lot of noise here. It's in terms of firefights, it's, you know, it's a lot less that we've been subject to in the last month here, right? Compared to what we had just in the previous week, helicopter shot down and all the rest. But he said, in case, um, um, in case you hear about it. Well, then the media just picked it up and whipped it into a, uh, into a frenzy. Were there any signs that they were going to do that bef bef before that, or was that basically the no, initiation? not signs, but there had been, um, you know, there's always indecision in Washington about, um, you know, there was uh, there was legitimately fatigue about there was a rock fatigue in Washington, and they're looking for scapegoats and looking for bad guys, and unfortunately, our company by working for the State Department under their operational control performing to a thousand page contract uh, walked into that X and got smacked how long after that did the indictment start well that was September 16 2007 and I'd say there was something within nine months to a year Right, and then there was all kinds of questions about jurisdiction and and where they do it, and you know, it also speaks to the how unjust it, uh, it all is that they they somehow horseshoed it all into trying them in Washington D.C. Okay, the for four patriots that have served their country from around the country from normal America, if they had a jury of their peers in Washington State, Idaho, Montana. Tennessee, Florida, normal America. And it took them multiple trials to, to try to find a get a conviction. So it's disgusting. I'd funded, the company funded all their legal defense. And, uh, and still, with a D.C. jury, they managed to get a conviction. What was the aftermath after that for Blackwater? Well, look, as part of, the, part of the onslaught of Washington, 
there was, it really literally started a subpoena, right? So I was called before Congress early October 2004, and they didn't really want to call me back up there after that hearing again, because I think I'd answered their questions and said, we're doing what we were told, this is the contract, this thousand page contract, and um, but then a blizzard of subpoenas started, right? Everything from Department of Labor, you know, um, uh, Treasury, Customs, State Department, export issues, ATF, even the Department of Agriculture was investigating us how we ship dog food. Are you serious? Oh, I'm not kidding. Literally a blizzard. And so uh, it's kind of the DC way, right? They, uh, they hit you with such a, uh, with an ambush from all sides that you try to make the organization crumble. And we held it together, and then they tried to, um, well, they did. They indicted Gary Jackson, Bill Matthews, and um, uh, the general counsel, Andy, and, uh, and two other people over completely bullshit charges. And I'll give you examples, right? All, and, and, and they said, hey, we're not really interested in you. Just give us something on Eric Prince. So the political whipping boy, the political prosecution, persecution just continued. So they indicted um, Gary and Bill, for example, on weapons charges, right? So in 2004, the King of Jordan had visited Blackwater, hosted by the CIA, because the U.S. was giving Jordan a big training facility. He wanted to come and see what Blackwater was like. A few days before, the guys from the agency called and say, hey, um, we kind of goofed it. We, we, we don't have a gift for the king. We need a gift. We're like, well, what is he like? He likes guns. Okay, we can do that. We provided him a a kind of a custom-tuned semi-auto M4, 12-gauge shotgun, and a Glock, right? Not exotic, not full auto. We gave it to him. The Secret Service took the boxes, thank you, put them in the, in the U.S. Secret Service vehicles. They left the property. Like six months later, the ATF is doing an audit. They're going through the books. They say, what's this? Oh, the King of Jordan was here, and we transferred those to him. They goes, ah, yeah, don't do it this way next time. Do it this way. No fine, no drama, nothing. Fast forward to 2007. Ah, they indicted us over that. They considered that a straw purchase, like they were giving weapons to a drug dealer. They invite, So the same ATF that said, that's an administrative error. Don't do the paperwork this way for a transfer. Do it this way. When it's politicized, they made it that way. So, same, another one, um, the agency, right? The agency wanted to, um, uh, they, the agency had done away with their paramilitary training as part of their case officer program years before, and they wanted weapons quals for all these students going through the pipeline. And they came to us and said, we want you to do this. They said, okay, fine, give us a contract, great. We got all the semi-auto guns. No, 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 it has to be full auto. They have to be able to shoot a full auto M4 and AK. I'm like, that's dumb. You don't really need to do that. Yes, they have to. Fine, make it happen. Give us the contract. No, no, figure it out, make it happen. So we made a donation, right? We already had one law enforcement organization that had permanent residence on the compound. The Virginia Beach Police Department leased an entire building from us in used ranges. So we made a donation to the Sheriff's Department Okay, because a private organization can't buy 25 AKs or M4s. You can buy four, but not 25. Or you can buy two samples of each. So the Camden Sheriff's Department stored those guns on the premises, knowing that they were there for the police to use, but also these federal government employees to use from time to time when they needed it. They would never leave the premises only for that purpose. The former... Inspector General of the Pentagon signed off on it. The county attorney signed off on it. Everybody's good. Nope. Straw purchase for illegal weapons. That's the kind of stupid shit that they indicted those guys for, which they had to finally finally grind through. And, and so millions of dollars later in their legal defense, when they finally, when the clowns at, at the DOJ finally realized that I was a knock, I'd had all kinds of authorities from the agency for this program talked about in the last chapter of my book, 
And the only reason I'm willing to talk about it is because those assholes already leaked my name. Uh, you know, they, they when Panetta briefed my name, briefed me by name to Congress, right? When, when the agency is briefing special programs, you're supposed to use code names to protect confidentiality. But he briefed me in true name, and within hours of him doing that, the New York Times and the Washington Post were calling me for comment. Just for the audience, Panetta was the director of CIA at the Under time. Under Obama, yes. So that's the only reason I give mention of that now. But when that, when the, when the realities of that finally made it to the idiot prosecutors, and frankly the the idiot senior leadership at the CIA, then the whole case went away. So there was, was just there was just a wave of. Oh, it was it was like termites. I mean, did you? What did you think? What was your mindset? Were you ready to combat it? Were you? Did you think it was going to go away, or did you Look, know? Paying legal. Uh, so, I, uh, I I saw that Elon Musk is forming an internal law firm to fight a whole bunch of specific cases. Hindsight, I should have done that. It would have been vastly superior to me to hire all my own legal team than to pay all these voracious other sets of termites of the Washington, D.C. lawyer crowd. That would have... So for anyone that's watching this that goes to the same circumstance, hire your own lawyers because most D.C. lawyers suck. They're, most D.C. lawyers are just as bad as the bureaucrats and regulators that hang out around political parties. So yes. had I done that, um, it would have been cheaper. The defensive fight would have been more effective. The only thing, we fought back on all fronts. Every audit, every, right? There was even whistleblower lawsuits brought against us by someone funded by Soros. And we fought that one all the way to the end to the point that it was a great victory in Alexandria, Virginia. The federal judge said they have not provided a scintilla of evidence of wrongdoing by us. And he made the, the, the whistleblower's counsel pay our legal fees, right? So that's the kind of, we push back on everything. The one place that they had us over a barrel was with the State Department with export regulations, right? And so Hillary Clinton's State Department stuck us with the highest per capita fine in State Department history for our illegal arms exports, Right, And let me give you some color on what that looks like. So if you're working for the State Department, right, you're working for the Bureau of Diplomatic Security. But the export stuff is handled by the DDTC, the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls. So as the State Department, the diplomatic security guys are demanding, hey, I need another 50 guys. I need another 200 guys urgently in this town to do this mission because people are at risk. And you have to export them the body armor, the helmets, the firearms, whatever that might be to send to them. The DDTC over here is still moving at the pace of peacetime or their own sweet time. And so even though the license application was in and we hadn't received it back, yeah, if I'm expected to send 50 guys into a combat zone, I'm not sending them naked. And so we'd send body armor or helmets or something like that. And so that's what they came back and fined us for, $500,000 per event. Holy shit. Okay? So for all their noise and all their bullshit, in a $42 million fine, they acknowledge in the report that there was no actual damage in any way to national security. It was just a political punishment. Wow. Yeah. $42 million. I have a pretty big chip on my shoulder for that yet. Oh, you can imagine. So, Yeah. Looking back, I wish we had never, ever answered the call of helping the State Department because in the end, it was the undoing of the company. I remember the first contact we ever got from the State Department was from the ATAP program, the Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program. And they wanted us to train the uh, Colombian presidential detail and the Greek presidential detail because this was right before the Olympics were going to be in Greece. And... Um, we put the whole proposal together, gave it to state, and they kicked it back to us and said, you can't submit this. It's just not credible. I said, why? They said, the price is so low. You can't, and, and we knew training. We'd been training thousands of guys, thousands of soft guys. They said, you can't submit this into our system because it will not be viewed as credible. It's so low. 
So we increased the price by 60%, resubmitted it. Okay, that was acceptable. 60%? Yeah, it's just disgusting. But coming from our perspective of being vertically integrated, and we knew what our costs were, right? One of the great um, disciplines I tried to, tried to push on the team was activity-based costs. Let's figure out what everything costs us to do so we're not guessing. And so we, we had gotten good at, at um, squeezing all the, or as many inefficiencies out of those processes that we could. And so we could, we could low bid. So by doing a, a firm fixed price contract, we had very good margins. And doing that by cutting out the waste meant so we could pay the men and the women a very good wage for doing their job. Let's talk about the CIA assassination program. Okay. What are they talking about? Well, um, after 9-11, there was, you know, in that that first year or two of real spine of seriousness about going after Al-Qaeda and hunting them and, and not letting another 9-11 happen, right? In that brief show of unity with all the members of Congress from both parties singing a song in Kumbaya on the front steps of the Capitol. Wonderful. Um, so the agency figured they needed some kind of unilateral capability to, um, uh, to take out terror targets, even in places where they were kind of protected or, or allowed to, to exist by semi-friendly countries like Germany, like, um, you know, various countries where because of local political considerations, they weren't necessarily playing ball with the agency. And so the agency wanted some unilateral capability and they went through some iterations of what that looks like. And eventually they asked uh, us to put something together. And um, yeah. <laughs> and it was uh, it was a really it was a really interesting education because it had to be all unilateral, moving documents and people and all the rest with no ties back to the U.S. government. So I won't go into a lot of detail on it, but it was a uh, it was a hell of capability. So after all this, and I and I, and I never would say anything about it, mm -hmm. but they briefed me by name to Congress. Yeah. And which um, which immediately was leaked to the media, which immediately endangered my family. Okay? So for all the noise about the media making about CIA leakages for this uh, Valerie Jarrett, no, the, the Valerie Plame stuff, hey, I was doing a program that was literally hunting the most wanted terrorists. And so, yeah, so that wound up, I wound up in the Al-Qaeda hit list from that. Um, so, yeah, I do take some issue with the, the typical Washington game of how they play. Because, look, I started Blackwater as a way to stay connected to the SEAL teams and to try to serve my country. We answered the call when the USG called again and again and again from thousands of people. We lost 43 of our men doing that mission. Multiple of our aircraft shot down. Um, and f f in, in 43 KIA and hundreds seriously wounded, just like active duty in the military, right? People that pay serious costs for a politician's decision to send them into harm's way. And I ended up behind where I was financially having sold the business because it got smashed in valuation and in... Um, and, and so, so what, right? Because men died, men were incarcerated, I think un unnecessarily and unjustly as because of, because of a, I would say a very broken Washington political process. When did you sell the company? 2010. <clears throat> After you sold the company, at what point did you move to Abu Dhabi? Uh, I'd moved about the same time we sold it. Why did you move? Uh, at that time, Somali piracy was raging off the coast of Somalia. They were taking 
80 to 90 ships per year, taking 1 million to 10 million in ransom per vessel. And the UAE leadership wanted to do something about it, right? That's a seafaring nation. They depend on trade, Dubai port, and, and exporting their crude. And they wanted to do something in a, in a chance meeting, um, explained what, um, what should happen. And uh, they said, yalla, let's so, go. And so they didn't want me directly involved with it. They just said, kind of lay out the, uh, the, um, the how and why to do this. And the Portland Marine Police Force was built, and that unit went active by early 2012. And you don't hear much about Somali piracy after that. No, you don't. It's funny how that works. Yeah. But it wasn't. Look, the the, the typical bureaucratic approach was ships chasing pirates all over the Indian Ocean. That's dumb, right? If you have a if you have a wasp problem in your yard. You find the nest and you deal with the nest. It doesn't take a genius to figure out where the pirates are in Somalia. If you fly along the coast, right, you don't need some KH-11 satellite imagery. You can fly along the coast in a King Air and say, oh, there's six ships anchored down there off this fishing village with no port. Must be pirates, right? And you go after the pirate logistics because when they'd go, they'd go to sea and they'd capture a vessel... They'd have to drive it back to the coast, and they'd have to put guards on that boat, and they'd have to sit on it for six months to a year waiting for the ransom to get paid. Another book that I read called The Pirate Coast, which, lay, which laid out the uh, how the U.S. dealt with the Barbary pirates in Libya in 1804-1805. Same kind of program. <laughs> a, former American, or, I mean, a former American Army officer, William Eaton, eight Marines, 90 contracted um, mercenaries, French, Greek, and Italian, right? The Marine Corps hymn goes from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. There was eight Marines on that deal and 90 contracted mercenaries. And that's what ended piracy for the United States in Libya. In this case, um, a, a contracted police force working with, by, and through the local Somali government, a police force to cut off the pirates' logistics so they couldn't pay feed and resupply their guards and the problem went away so it wasn't a hit squad no okay no No. in fact it really wasn't that kinetic at all yeah they were armed i mean logistically it was hard the first mission they had to do was 500 kilometers one way on roads that hadn't been graded or improved in 30 years so it was um it was those kind of challenges to solve and it was it was really south african guys some ex uh, executive outcomes team that came and did it and they built the police force and it worked there's a um there's a documentary that was shot through the process called the somalia project okay. that answers that question it's on youtube and it's free <laughs> all right and it actually won an award at the toronto film festival oh really yeah well because again check it out. knowing it would be controversial knowing that the clowns at the state department and the Obama administration did everything they could to block a program like that because it's not something they directly controlled. It's it's it is such a mess. It is such a fetid swamp. Trump was right to call it a swamp. It is. Going back just a little bit, so you moving to Abu Dhabi did that not that didn't have anything to do with the politics that with the uh, political system smearing your name in the, in the public. Was and, I sick of the Washington nonsense? Sure. Yeah. But I, I, I came and went to the United States. It's not like I fled. I didn't go to exile. I had, I had some kids that still lived in the States, so I'd come back every few weeks to see them. Okay. Yeah. I was coming and going all over the world for, for those three years. Okay. And so, and so coming off of that, I started a, a small private equity firm to do some exploration and some mining stuff. And uh, I got some interesting experience in Africa. And then while I was raising money for that, um, in Hong Kong, a, uh, a Hong Kong businessman contacted me and said, hey, please help us build a logistics business based in Hong Kong to do aviation, transportation, kind of security uh, in Africa for a lot of these big Chinese projects, whether they're building a road or a mine or a port or whatever. And so that was Frontier Service Group. And as that company got more and more investment from the Chinese mainland, it was a 
A, it was an interesting but alarming look inside of how the, um, the state-owned enterprises work, that they're very political organizations, not really based on merit or not, not in any way based on mission. It was kind of the antithesis of what I'd ever um, seen in my professional life before. And so uh, I left there a year and a half ago. But an interesting window that there is nothing we want in the United States. We do not want to be scenicized. We do not want to be to operate the way the CCP does, right? They still have the country locked down in large portions, locking down Shanghai, 30 million people. That's the most affluent part of China. Uh, claiming to be over COVID, really it's over politics because Xi, Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, is trying to be elected to a third five-year term. And that's kind of unprecedented really since Mao. And there's three factions to the Chinese Communist Party. There's the Young Princelings, of which he is one. There's the Communist Youth League, and there's the Shanghai faction. And because of all the wealth that's concentrated in Shanghai, Shanghai is a likely place for opposition to foment to, to Xi's continued rule. So I think Shanghai is in lockdown right now, literally welding people into their homes with fences because of that. So again, I think the um, when, <clears throat> when Ronald Reagan was elected... I think we're in a very um, similar time to 1976 to 1980, to the Carter years. Runaway inflation, the economy is going to the tank, a bunch of foreign policy setbacks, and then Reagan is elected on a, hey, we're going we're gonna to bring America back. America can do better than this. And on the foreign policy side, right, the, the policy of the United States for 35 years since World War II until 1980 had been containment. We're just going to contain the Soviet Union and the spread of communism. And Reagan said, no, we're going to fuck the commies. He actually said that in the Oval Office. We're going to push back on them economically, politically, culturally, socially, all the rest. There was 20 covert action findings, some of which were even initiated by Carter, because even Carter... Have the Carter administration, having had their, their butts kicked, finally came around to their senses, but Reagan fully enacted that to go after the Soviet Union in all those ways to take them down. Not with conventional military forces, but all the other acts of subterfuge that the intelligence community should be doing. And what happened? 89, the Berlin Wall, uh, the, 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 the Iron Curtain comes down, and by 91, the Soviet Union is done, okay? I think the United States has to push back on the Communist Party of China the same way. Chinese people, not our enemy. Chinese Communist Party is antithetical to the American way of life. It is antithetical to the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights and to the things that we appreciate in America. And that has to stop. I 100% agree with you on that. And I'm going to be honest, when I was researching you and I saw that uh, Frontier, what was it, Frontier? Frontier Service Group. Frontier Service Group was so involved with China and building infrastructure in Africa that I was really surprised. Did that, were you alarmed at all at how much influence China has over in Africa? Um, they, they appear to have some influence, but it's, it's really not that hard to push them back. It's not. No. How no, no, would we no. do that? No, no. Um, look, they come, they're, they're basically pushing into a vacuum, meaning Africans, African countries need infrastructure. They want electric power. They need a hard surface road. They need ports. They need trade. All the things that we take for granted in the West, right? The ability for a farmer in America to raise his crop, put it on a truck, take it to a co-op, which can then sell it on into the stream of commerce, that in most cases in Africa doesn't exist. Most African families live with like have less than a hundred watt light bulb worth of electricity a day. Wow. Okay. And so when China comes and promises, hey, uh, let us have this all this concession, and we'll build you this port and road, right? African countries take that deal. 
if it's even more controversial, right, the, the, the Chinese do black bag diplomacy really well, meaning they pay cash. They, I'm told that um, in the basement of the foreign ministry in Beijing, that um, they take African leaders or not just African, any, any leader from around the world that China wants to do business with, or the mining minister, or the energy minister, or the foreign minister, and they take them to this big vault room and their safety deposit boxes. And they take them to one box and have their name on it, and they open it up and it's gold bars or cash or whatever. And they'll say, this is yours waiting for you here as long as you play ball for us while you're in office. Look, it's, China is an ancient society. It's a, it's, as, a, as you know, remember, over the last 2,000 years, China, for 19 out of those 20 centuries, was the largest economy on the planet. Remember that. So China views itself as the center of the universe, the middle kingdom. And so they're trying to restore themselves to that kind of grandeur in world leadership. And the question is, does America want to be, is, are they comfortable being pushed into second place by a lot of, I would say self-inflicted wounds to ourself, or are we going to rally and organize and and do what made America effective and free, and 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 wealthy, and return to those basic values and focuses, or do we continue on this woke nightmare and drive ourselves into second or third or or worse place? What do you think is going to happen? Elections do have consequences. And, and they have to have consequences. And I think the most important thing um, to focus on in the next election is uh, control the bureaucracy, to actually have accountability for the federal government. Because I think the real constitutional crisis is we're supposed to have three branches of government, right? Executive, legislative, judiciary, but we have four. We have a permanent state bureaucracy that's accountable to no one, that... Congress can yell at, and that really changes anything. The, the, the White House can yell at, but can't hire and fire most of the bureaucrats under its wing. CIA is different. Actually, CIA and the Peace Corps are the only two federal agencies in Washington where the civil, ser civil service rules don't necessarily apply. So the director can change and fire quickly. So the CIA should be quick to fix under right leadership. But beyond call it reform and control of the civil service bureaucracy, and to pare it down, right? I hate the fact that the five counties surrounding Washington are per capita the wealthiest in the country. That's a very unhealthy sign that that much wealth is sponged off the imperial city to the detriment of, of the rest of the country where actual normal work is done. And the second thing is, I think we have to restore competitiveness in competition inside of America. The Federal Trade Commission and the antitrust parts of the government have to be cleaned out and reworked. And, and the amount of, of monopolies or duopolies or oligopolies, right, where you have a couple of companies that have such control over the markets that it squeezes all the competition, right? Look at, look at the beef industry. All the beef in America is processed by, I think, four major processors. All the farmers who do the hardest part of the work for years, months and years at a time, they absolutely get screwed because all the processors are controlled by those big four, okay? Whether it's big beef or big chicken, and the same in the airline industry, the same in, in big tech. Um, America was great when it was um, lots of small companies with lots of sharp elbows and everybody scrambling and innovating and, and really pushing that competition. But when you have, uh, when you have Washington reinforcing and scratching the back of big tech and big biz big business, it's extremely dangerous for the future of the country. Back to China or back to Africa. What are they mining there? Well, remember, China um, over the next five years will have another three hundred million people move from rural communities into cities. Right, so. You have to house 300 million people or almost the population of the United States you have to build housing for in the next five years. So when China goes out looking for energy, right? Because they import 90% of their energy, their hydrocarbon energy. 
they have to build, right? If you're doing even green energy, you need an enormous amount of copper to transmit the power from where you generate it to where you're using it. And iron ore for, for steel, for rebar, for all the things you build a house with. Um, so they're going out to find those, those resources. China as a country, uh, as a government, has made a very concerted effort to kind of leapfrog past the internal combustion engine, right? Because it was going to be a cold day in hell before China could build a better car engine than Porsche or Toyota or, or even a U.S. one, right? So they have gone all in on battery, minerals, electric vehicles. And they have made a very concerted effort to control not just the source of rare earths, right? The like the NDPR, all the things you need to make a very high-end electric motor and a very high-end long-duration quick recharge battery. Cobalt, nickel, neodymium, all those. I won't go deep on that. But the processing for those minerals is where China controls about 95% of the world's supply. And so that's a area that the U.S. should make some strategic investment, right? I certainly believe in capitalism and the free market as long as everyone else does. And in the case of China, you have a very state-managed uh, capitalism. They say uh, uh, it's capitalism, or so, sorry, socialism with Chinese characteristics. For that matter, capitalism also with Chinese characteristics because they, they very much, with government direction, throw hundreds of billions of dollars to target um, specific industries that they want to be dominant in to the point of driving out any of their U.S. competitors, which they have done in um, particularly in battery minerals uh, in that processing. They call them rare earth elements. Like the only producing rare earth mine in the United States now is in Mountain Pass, California, and all the offtake goes to China. No shit. Fact. I mean, this is just extremely we were, we, concerning. We were shareholders in a very rich rare earth mine um, in Burundi. And uh, the processing, the offtake from that mine went to Germany, where there was a couple stages done, but then eventually all that went to um, uh, went to China as well. And here's the thing. It's not a it's not a hundred billion dollar problem to fix. It's probably a, a, it's a ten billion dollar problem to fix or less, right? So instead of I would say pissing away $40 billion in aid like Congress is just doing to Ukraine for everyone to make noise about, um, you know, strategic minerals and, and, and Chinese um, hegemony in those spaces, $10 billion spent well in America solves that issue, right? Some of the processing of those rare earths is kind of a nasty, dirty process. Okay, fine. Accept that. Do it at Dugway Proving Ground which is where the U.S. Army does its chemical, westing, chemical weapons testing. You're never going to build condos there, but say that's where the United States is going to process those minerals. And you do it like a contractor-managed facility like they do for ammunition plants. It doesn't... It, my, my biggest frustration on top of the, the, I would say, the corruption and incompetence in Washington is just a lack of imagination on how to solve these problems. Do you think it's just straight incompetence? I think it's... Um, I think it's just reinforced groupthink. I, I, when I look at if, if, if the combined Republican and Democrat administrations of the last 20 years, for all the smart people that have come through Harvard and Yale and all these Ivy League schools in these foreign policy positions, and if this is the best they've got, I would, I would look for another source for my foreign policy experts going forward. Because whether it's the Iraq invasion and how the war was conducted against really not just... Sunni insurgents, but the Iranians fighting in Iraq versus the United States as well being defeated in Afghanistan by 90% illiterate goat herders with no external support, really. Because remember, when we were fighting the Soviets in the 80s, no, when the Mujahideen were fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, the U.S. was giving a billion dollars in lethal aid in 1985 dollars which would be more like $3 billion in lethal aid going to the Taliban now. Nothing like that. Nobody ever gave them that kind of support. But yet we were defeated. All the techno-wizardry of the U.S. Army 
and the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Marine Corps. Great fighting men and women, great capability, all that equipment with bad, weak leadership, with weak political leadership, and we got our butts kicked. And it's what an embarrassment. And for everybody that lost a loved one or an, a limb or a spouse or a relationship over the Iraq and, and Afghanistan conflicts, they should be pissed. I'm pissed. I spent a lot of my life and, and put a huge effort into helping the U.S. government there to have them piss it away they did. It's just wrong. I'm totally and, and with you on that. It, this is no. a direct result of an all-volunteer force. I'm not saying we have to have a draft, but if you have one half of 1% serving in the military, right? You have about 1.5 million people, give or take, in the U.S. forces, active duty. You have another 3 to 4% that knows that half percent. Family, friends, that circle, that tribe leaving the other 95% of America with no clue and no skin in the game. And so that allows really idiot politicians to be continually disassociated from reality, making those kind of decisions. Well, since we're on the, since we're on the Afghan pullout now, and we're talking about Chinese mining and an incompetent government, China's extracting lithium out of Africa. China was there when we pulled out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan pullout seemed extremely abrupt and there was definitely, there, it's obvious there was no plan. Chinese were there to negotiate with Taliban. Now, supposedly they're extracting lithium out of Afghanistan. We're, we have this green initiative, which we're going to import all of our solar panels and batteries from China. Do you think that the current administration was paid off by China to pull out of Afghanistan so that they could extract? No. I, and in fact, if, if I, would, I would imagine, not imagine, I would posit that if China had its choice, America would have stayed in Afghanistan somehow. Why? Because the one group that the CCP is scared of are the Uyghurs, right? The Uyghurs are an ethnic Turkic people. Um, they are not Han Chinese. They are Muslim, and they're primarily from the northwest corner of China called Xinjiang province, okay? And they have been in conflict with the CCP because they've tried to hold through to Islam, and they have been resisting it. And there's huge pipelines from Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan with the natural gas that flows through Xinjiang province that literally powers Beijing and the whole eastern seaboard. Like I said before, China imports 90% of its hydrocarbon energy. And so the Uyghurs, they've not been able to control. And so they've, they've built camps, they build re-education camps. They're doing some terrible things and getting away with it up there. And the Uyghurs that could have sanctuary in Afghanistan is a major threat to China, which is why the Chinese are paying the Taliban almost whatever it takes to try to suppress uh, the Uyghurs from having sanctuary in, in Afghanistan. China signed up early for a lot of the concessions in Afghanistan because there's enormous wealth in the ground in Afghanistan. And the disgusting thing, and why, so... You're quoted as saying there's over a trillion dollars in the ground there. At least, yes. And that's not my number. That's the U.S. Geological Survey, which flew um, ma magnetic and gravity airborne surveys, finding enormous amounts of copper, hydrocarbons, and other minerals of value in Afghanistan. Okay? <clears throat> so let me back up on Afghanistan briefly. I've, I've known Steve Bannon for years since I, uh, since I wrote my book, which I think came out in 2013, and I did a, like a radio event with him. And I've stayed in touch with them ever since. And wrote a bunch of foreign policy papers on positions Trump, candidate Trump should take for the 2016 election. And he contacted me within months of Trump being elected. And he said, hey, we're trying to figure out what to do on Afghanistan. Write up what you think should be done. And write an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. So I did. And I wrote it for an audience of one. And I'm told that uh, by a guy that was in the room that Trump read my op-ed, circled it, called in the National Security Advisor, who was then H.R. McMaster, and said, I don't like your plan. I like this one. Do this. Because McMaster had just asked to send another 70,000 troops back to Afghanistan in 2017. 
And so that started back and forth. And of course, McMaster, being a three-star armor officer from the Pentagon who wanted a four-star, of course said no. Hell no, right? I went and saw Mattis at the White House direction at the Pentagon. Uh, he said my analysis of the root problems was the best that he saw, but he just couldn't accept contractors doing it. Because what I laid out was basically a repeat of what worked in the first six to eight months of Afghanistan, right? <sighs> Using special operations, veterans, right? Everybody loves the word veterans. They hate the word contractor. It's the same thing. <laughs> um, uh, veterans, contractors attached to each Afghan battalion. I wanted to do 36 guys per battalion because I wanted enough... Uh, I wanted enough contracted talent there so that every time an Afghan unit left the wire, whether it's a platoon size, company size, whatever, there were mentors with them to provide leadership, intelligence, communications, medical, logistics expertise, right? The five things you got to get right in a unit. And if one of those fails, it can all go to shit, right? So I wanted veterans to go live with the Afghans. It's the same. Everything I, everything I wrote up was really based on how the East India Company functioned and flourished for 250 years right next door, right? They built units of 19 locals, one expat, and they lived with them for years. They were called the Presidency Armies. So I kind of modeled a, a battalion structure with veterans attached the same way. And because of the nature uh, of, of employing veteran contractors, I can send a guy for 60 days or 90 days and then he goes home for, for 30 days, back in, but always to the same unit in the same valley, so he knows those Afghans. Those are his brothers. The problem with the U.S. presence in Afghanistan for 20 years is we went through almost 30 troop rotations where you send guys in, they might be effective for a few months, and they leave, and they shift, and they never come back to the same area. More than 30 times. So we didn't really fight for 20 years. We fought for 30 different rotations. But our, our approach... What I recommended was to solve that by attaching at the battalion level, living with, patrolling with, and even fighting with those guys, not living at some distant U.S. base where they'd kind of commute to mentor them once a week. No, same barracks, same chow hall. I would have provided air support, about 90 aircraft. Again, flown right seat, left seat, one contractor, and one uh, and one Afghan pilot. So if there's any weapon released, it's an Afghan making that decision. Um, the professional pilot there, so that you had the night vision time, you had the safety lined up, and it kind of took away the the inshallah factor, right? Yeah. Don't take away the excuses of, ah, oh, we're not going today, it's too dangerous. No, no, you're going now. It's on. And we could have provided jets, the whole package, for a fraction, right? The, I, I found an entire Israeli squadron of A4s that were for sale, that would have been perfect and cheap, and um, it would have worked. And then the other, the third part of it we have to do is the combat logistics, right? You have to pay the men on time, feed them on time, resupply them, and take care of them medically. It was so bad, right, in this rush to over-empower the Afghans, right? Unlike most people, I've read most of the SIGAR reports, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, where he just catalogs the same failures made for 20 years. So how do we have these people put in these assistant secretary of whatever positions of responsibility making the same damn mistakes that they were making a decade or two decades earlier? How do we consider these people smart or qualified when they're just continually failing? So again, you know, you have the, the issue of ghost soldiers, of right, in every society where there's corruption. If you throw money at a problem, it grows the corruption. And that's what America does. America knows how to fire hose cash onto a problem, which made all those little weeds into major trees of problems. So again, it, 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 putting, putting a few dudes in there to control the pay, the parts supply, the fuel, the ammunition, uh, and medical the whole program would have cost less than 5% of what the U.S. was, was spending. And I trust, trust me, we would have put the Taliban on their knees again because of the whole, that package would have performed like a much more robust version of what stomped on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in, in early 2002, in late 2001. 
There is already 140 Taliban sanctuaries in Afghanistan just in the last months of us being there. And trust me, Al-Qaeda is all over the country again. And and so for all the the uh, administration assurances that um, this was never going to be a terror sanctuary again, absolutely it will be. Do you think we're going back there? I don't know. If, I, I, I hope we never go back there with the U.S. military. There is not one conventional soldier should ever set foot in that country again. Because... And it's, it's no diss on the on the soldiers, but it's how they're employed. I heard I heard a fundamental description at a at an early special operations conference when I was a young officer. Is the different mentality in a right as you as we're seeing in Ukraine right now, artillery is still the king of battle in big conventional fights, right? So in a conventional military, you man the equipment because it's the equipment that does the heavy fighting. The killing, the artillery, the rockets, the tanks. In a soft unit, you equip the man because the man is the weapon system to be employed in very niche, very special applications. And that's the kind of flexibility and speed and lightweight that you need to operate against an insurgency, right? Because we, the United States in Afghanistan was defeated by an enemy that was largely illiterate, untrained, using weapons that had been designed 70 years earlier. And they defeated all the billions of dollars of techno wizardry. I mean, I'd, I'd go to the the Association of the U.S. Army show in 2005 through through now, and all that stuff, and the Taliban kicked their ass. It's disgusting. It didn't kick the ass of the sergeant, or the gunnery sergeant, or the smart captain. But man, it's like once they once once officers pass the range, the, the rank of 04, it's almost like their brains are are transformed into something that just doesn't um, doesn't want to fight the way that's that's that needs to be done. Yeah. Damn. Let's take a quick break. All right. Seventy-five percent of the human population struggles with sleep. I was part of that 75%. I'm a new parent, I'm a business owner, my mind goes about a thousand miles an hour of all hours of the day and night, and it's hard to sleep. So I started looking into it, it turns out it's a magnesium deficiency. So let me tell you about bio-optimizers. Bio-optimizers has identified seven different unique types of magnesium when put together help you sleep. It's easy. You take two pills before you go to bed, you sleep like a baby, you wake up energized, and your morning routine is just ready to roll. For an exclusive offer for my listeners, go to magbreakthrough.com slash Sean to save up to 42%. Again, you can save up to 42% on Magnesium Breakthrough when you go to magbreakthrough.com slash Sean. All right, Eric, we took a quick break. Now I want to know what happened to the plan. Where did it get tied up? Sadly, it got, uh, it, it died in the womb. It, um, the bureaucracy around Trump um, killed it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think Trump ever really controlled his national security bureaucracy. I think um, Mike Pompeo, as director, depended on Gina Haspel, a career agency officer that was then made director after him. Um, she didn't want to do anything, touching anything that would be different or hard or controversial for the agency. There's a big difference between how DOD fights wars under Title 10 authorities versus the agency, which is Title 50. Remember, when the U.S. went into Afghanistan, right, the, 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 S, the Special Forces A-teams, the agency officers, hell, even the aircraft flying overhead 
were there under Title 50 CIA authorities. That worked. Very flexible, very fast, very maneuverable. When the Pentagon pivoted to become the big Title 10 beast in the room for the next 20 years, that's where we failed. DOD is good at fighting big conventional wars. What they did in 2003 in rolling up Saddam's army, brilliant, fantastic. Fighting the insurgency after that, not brilliant. Um, when the SEAL team guys rolled into Abbottabad, Pakistan to kill bin Laden, they were not there under Title 10. They were there under Title 50 authorities working for the director of CIA. So I recommended that that plan, right, as DOD leaves, that a that a Title 50 authority take over and that this kind of advise, assist, support element to keep the Afghan government from tipping over and to continue a effective counterterrorism mission, that it pivot to the agency. Of course, the Pentagon is about money and about reach and, and, and turf, and they wanted nothing to do with that. And the agency, under a different director, could have seized the thing, could have, could have taken the initiative and said, yep, Mr. Trump, we'll do this, go. Um, it's really sad because everything I laid out was not theoretical for us. Um, we'd had hundreds, if not thousands, of advisors trainers in country before. We'd had up to 56 of our aircraft in Afghanistan flying those kind of support missions. Hell, we'd even, um, with a Super Tucano, right? I, I owned the first Super Tucano aircraft. It's a single engine Brazilian made turboprop aircraft. It looks like a little light fighter plane. And I bought one in 2005, took it to the States and we fitted it out with a FLIR Okay, a big MX-15, so you could, with a, a, a FLIR, with a laser. It had a um, cell phone intercept equipment on it. It had Link-16 aircraft, so we could talk to every other fast mover in the U.S. military. And we had it kitted out for a JSOC program so that they could find, fix, and finish by themselves with a contractor pilot flying it and an a active duty guy running the um, sensor systems and dropping any weapons, because that aircraft could even drop two 500-pound laser-guided bombs. It was fantastic. We actually even did a study that we could have taken over every close air support mission over Afghanistan with that aircraft. It had more coverage with all the right kind of hardware. And the whole program would have paid for itself in fuel savings in seven months. I mean, so even a private equity guy would have funded it. But those are the kind of cost-saving innovations that the military bureaucracy just cannot, will not, accept. And that's the frustration why we have these perpetual wars which never seem to end and no one is really put in charge. Coming back to the op-ed that I wrote that Trump liked and he circled, I said, you need to appoint a viceroy, right? And that's a spicy term. It's a loaded term. That's a colonial term. But I wanted it to be spicy. I wanted people to pay attention. He needed one person in charge. Unity of command one person who's responsible, one person who's accountable. There wasn't one person who was in charge of the effort in Afghanistan for the entire 20 years we were there. State Department was doing their thing. DOD was doing their thing. CIA's over here. NATO's over there. We never had one person that was in charge. When the British were in India, they appointed one person who represented Her Majesty's government that had all power to make those decisions. And the issue about Afghanistan, right? Because the other lesson from the East India Company is that it's much easier to employ people than to fight them. And when you, before you'd mentioned about the Chinese interested in minerals and all the rest in Afghanistan, yeah, there's a trillion dollars of value in the ground. And the U.S. didn't go after any of it while it was there. How Pre long have they known about that? From the Soviet times, the Soviets, old, the Soviets did a better old. job of extracting resources in Afghanistan in the 10 years we were there, that they were there, versus the 20 that the U.S. was there. And I'll give you two examples. One, um, in the southeast corner of Balk province, there's an Amu Darya oil field. It was drilled, proven, all, all the wells hit, fully ready for commercialization. You could have redrilled the five wells that were cemented and another 15, and you could have powered the entire country, okay? 
of the 60 some billion dollars that the US was spending per year in Afghanistan, a huge chunk of that was fuel costs, okay? And you know where that fuel came from? The Mediterranean, a defense logistics agency contract, put it on a boat down through the Red Sea, across the Indian Ocean to Karachi, and then on a truck up into Paki- up across Pakistan into Afghanistan, paying all those Taliban tolls. So by the time that jet fuel or diesel fuel got to where it's used in Afghanistan, the fully loaded cost on it was $250 a gallon. Okay? Our tax money spent that way. While the Amudarya oil field is sitting there untapped, largely for the duration of our presence there. Wow. Okay? 20 million bucks would have redrilled those wells. 100 million bucks to put a mod to the refinery there and you would have powered every jet, every truck, everything. And then for that matter, probably 50 other power plants in Afghanistan that would have burned HFO, the bottoms, the heavy fuel oil, the stuff that you get off the bottom of a refinery, would have made Afghanistan self-sustaining in energy and not have to depend on all those trucks. Second, the Mas Ainak mine, okay, which is about 50 kilometers, 30-ish miles south of Kabul, one of the largest single copper deposits in the world. And they've known about that for a thousand years because there was all kinds of archaeological constraints to it. But you know what? If I was in a position of responsibility, and for and so for all the generals that rotated through of the 17 or 18 different commanders we had, none of them said, hey, I'm going to reopen Masanak Mine, and I can employ 10,000 Taliban doing it because I'm going to give them all a pick and a shovel and three square meals a day, and I can suck an entire infantry division of ta- ta- Taliban manpower away from the Taliban. Because most of the Taliban were just paid fighters. They weren't like fully committed jihadis, Right. So if the Taliban's paying $10 a day and we pay $12 a day and we feed them and we're not going to kill them, that's great. That's how the British Empire dominated the whole subcontinent for 250 years effectively. And that's my frustration with these so-called smart leaders that are in charge. And they say, well, we can't do that within within our responsibility. Well, then demand that kind of authority. Demand that kind of responsibility to fix the problem. Don't piss away our sons and daughters' health or their lives. And don't piss away tens of billions of our taxpayer dollars just managing the conflict. Have enough have enough spine to say, I'm going to solve that freaking problem, or I'm not going to shut up until I do. That's my frustration with them. So laying out a plan that would have given the Afghan forces a reliable way to, to be supported to have confidence that they were going to be um, helped. It, I mean, it, it got so bad in the last eight years of U.S. presence there that the Taliban were resorting to the, the most ancient of tactics, siege tactics, right? They'd roll two, 300 Taliban out of the hills and they'd surround an Afghan combat out, outpost, right? And they'd lay siege to it. Nobody in, nobody out. And they'd be calling down there, shouting insults, all the rest. Hey, we're going to kill you if you don't come out. We're gonna... And it got so bad that the Afghan military leaders inside the camp would be calling back to a TV station, back to Tullo News in Kabul, into a call-in show, pleading for someone to come and help them. With all the wonderful U.S. military helicopters, with all the stuff that the taxpayers spent, nobody had the organization or the responsibility to say, hey, we're going to come and help you, or even better, hey, now the Taliban have provided us with 200 targets surrounding that camp, and we're going to smoke them all, right? Why doesn't the AC-130 roll in there in broad daylight and smoke them? Oh, wait, why? Because the AC-130, flown by the U.S. Air Force, won't fly in daylight. It's a $250 million asset that will not fly in daytime for combat support. That's the kind of bureaucratization of war that I chafe against in the U.S. military that so badly needs reform. It's like a dirty rug that just needs to be shaken. You're the only person I've ever heard talk about this. This is uh, well. This is incredible. So that's just, just bureaucratic layer upon layer, right? It's like wrapping a whole bunch of Talmuds around the Torah so you never get back to your, your authorities that you should be doing. And, and we've allowed lawyers... 
in the military, right? They're now down to low, very, very low levels of units that all have a JAG. And I think we've allowed them to become what Zompolits were in the Soviet Union, right? You know what a Zompolit is? I don't. It's a political officer who is literally there to... Um, do you remember the movie um, The Hunt for Red October? Yes. Right? The Zompolit was the guy that that's assigned, like in the Soviet Union, to every ship, submarine... Air, uh, Air Force Squadron, Army Division, okay? He is there to enforce the will of the Communist Party. And in this case, lawyers were there to enforce the will of Washington and, and constantly undermining, second-guessing the battlefield commanders. And I think, okay, fine. If you want to have lawyers at that level, fine. Make it like the Marine Corps. Make every Marine a rifleman. Every lawyer must be a rifleman. Make them spend at least one or two combat deployments in the in the field, getting shot at, before they get to make legal decisions about when people can drop bombs and not to. Make them live with those consequences first. I'm becoming infuriated. Sorry. Um, let's move into Ukraine. Ukraine-Russia conflict. Okay. What should we be doing there, if anything at all? Well, I've been to Ukraine quite a bit, not lately, but uh, long before the conflict, because uh, there's an amazing amount of tech and amazing amount of industry there. We were actually trying to buy a business, um, which didn't work out. But I laid out uh, in a document passed up by some people I know in the chain of command. It, it did not have my name on it at all, so they couldn't play the I Hate Eric Prince card. But I basically laid out a combination of Lend-Lease and a Flying Tiger approach to prevent the invasion from happening. Because I was pretty confident the Russians were going to go in. Well, we had a conversation before you got here, and you actually pegged the exact day that it happened. Yeah, it's based on weather. But, um, but in December, I laid out. And, and it, was, it was a simple way to, to back up from that. So in this fiscal year, right, fiscal year 2022... The U.S. Air Force has already announced that they're retiring 200 combat aircraft, okay? Being taken from an active fighting flying squadron, flown to the desert in Arizona, and parked for eternity, written off to zero value to the taxpayers, okay? Including about 50 F-15s, 50 F-16s, and 42 A-10s. For your listeners, F-15, air superiority aircraft... F-16, air superiority and ground attack, and A-10, the best tank-killing aircraft ever made, literally made back in the 70s to kill Russian tanks. All being flown to the desert, wasted. I said, fly any combination of those to Ukraine, right? A, for a carrot and stick. Carrot is, yes, Russia, don't worry, Ukraine will never be part of NATO. Let's close that discussion. Because they don't need to be, Right? Um, our sons and daughters don't need to be the guarantors and defenders of Europe. Europe can wake up and do the right thing, including Germany, which they still have not really done. Well, they can't really because they're energy dependent off Russia. Well, yeah. And on top of that, <laughs> the Germans closed three nuclear power plants in December of last year, earlier than originally planned, just to be in accordance with their Green New Deal plan that they wanted to roll out in Germany, making them even more dependent on Russian energy. But back to what I wanted, what I recommended for, for Ukraine, right? So take the NATO thing off the table for Ukraine, no problem. Um, but fly these, some of these old aircraft to Ukraine, put Ukrainian roundels on them. You can use Ukrainian pilots. You can use contractor pilots, any combination, just like, right? Remember, the Flying Tigers was a, we used for about one year, before the United States was involved in World War II, but we wanted to help stop the Japanese from bombing Chinese cities. They allowed U.S. aircraft flown by contractor pilots. It did exactly that, working for a foreign entity. In this case, those old U.S. aircraft that were already written off, transferred them to Ukraine. Um, a, a budget, I think 250 million bucks, would have been enough to make those aircraft flyable, fund the pilots, the fuel, and the weapons, and you would have had all the deterrence needed 
to prevent a Russian invasion instead of the f not, not close to $50 billion that the U.S. has spent, I would say pissed away in Ukraine now, it's just a pile of wrong. It's the lack of imagination, the lack of any knowledge of history from these so-called smart people, and there's no accountability. How, as taxpayers, can we allow such incompetence to rule for the debacle that was Iraq, the debacle that's Afghanistan, and even the, a, a preventable debacle of Ukraine? I have that. That's that's my frustration for all these people that they want to say, ah, it's a it's a terrible plan. He's an evil mercenary. Whatever pejorative they want to throw at me, I say fine. Call me whatever shithead name you want to, but I'd rather be right than a shithead. And on these, I'm right. Okay. If and 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 you know what? Even President Trump, I saw him in 2019 at a veterans event. Oddly enough. And he came up to me, he said, Eric, you were right. I should have listened to you in Afghanistan. I said, ah, Mr. President, that's the only time I saw him when he was president of the United States in person. I said, please, there's still time. Give us a chance to do this. Sadly, no. But again, he never really controlled his national security apparatus. Mark Esper, terrible sec def. Um, so it, it, again, if you keep drawing from the well that is Washington, D.C., we'll keep having the same failures. And anybody that says Iraq was a great success or Afghanistan, I mean, I will never forget the image of thousands of people running ahead of, alongside of, and grabbing onto C-17s that are taking off. What an awful image. Yeah. And from the beginning, in whatever paper I submitted, I said, I want to prevent the rooftop, the helicopter off the rooftop moment. Because I was six years old when that happened in Saigon in 75. And I still remember that. And that image of Afghanistan is one that every friend or foe of America around the world remembers. And it is a huge fucking black eye. Yeah. Yes, it is. Let's move into the Volgner group. Yes. So... <clears throat> The Russians have woken up to, well, I'd say they continued on with a with a spectrum of conflict, right? And I'll back up even further in saying in 2011, while I lived in the Middle East, while uh, the Biden the Obama administration was in their great reset with Russia and they were going to be pals with them, the Russians actually invited me to Moscow and pitched me and said, please come and build a Blackwater capability here in oh, Russia. Shit. Yeah. Yeah, I went shooting with their Alpha Group, <laughs> their elite Tier 1 unit, had, um, had beers with them after that, and they had explained that they had done 300 kill capture missions inside of Russia in the previous year because they had still problems in Chechnya and Dagestan. And, and remember that they lost 15,000 troops in the late 90s, early 2000s, fighting in Chechnya and Grozny and Dagestan. So they had, they had their own issues to wrestle with. But they wanted to build a hybrid capability. And I said, thanks, but I, I can't do that. And sure enough, two, three years later, they roll out. You see the, here the stories about these little green men of not necessarily military guys seizing all these key objectives when the Russians seized the Crimea and the, the Donbass and the contested areas now in eastern Ukraine. And then you see them use them in Syria to pretty great effect. Not great, I would say effective for them. Uh, they use them in Madagascar, in Central African Republic, now in Mali, in Libya, and certainly uh, in Ukraine now as part of their, their major combat operation. Wagner Group offers, I would say, the, the whole spectrum of support, whether it's political messaging, propaganda, social media ma manipulation on one end, through training of police, military, border units, that kind of thing, all the way up to full-on combat formations, battalion size, even brigade size um, activity. And it's a, an extension of the Russian state, but yet uh, deniable enough. 
I mean, the reason, right, you heard about a big firefight between some U.S. soft guys in Syria, um, in the east of Syria. Um, I can't think of where the oil field was. It'll come back to me. But that oil field had been producing 400,000 barrels a day. It was Syrian's oil supply. And the U.S. was sitting on it. And the Wagner guys and some Syrian army guys were going to take it. Why? Because they wanted the oil. They wanted to turn that energy supply back on. And it was kind of a, um, it was a prize that they were after. So the Russians use that capability as, a, as an extension of Kremlin political desires with the deniability that comes from not being necessarily a function of the Russian state. And they asked you to build that. Yeah. When was that? 2011. So if you were a war profiteer, which very commonly follows your name in the press, you 100% would have done that. But you didn't. Yeah, I would have been a multi-billionaire, which I am definitely not. <laughs> but, no, I, and, and, you know, the funny thing is, you know, there's, there's a lot of contractors in history that have, uh, that have fought under many flags. And uh, even John Paul Jones, who's... Um, who died in the service of, uh, of Russia, and they brought him back from from Russia. He's buried at the he's buried under the chapel uh, uh, in Annapolis at the academy. And I think he's buried in vodka in a in a vodka filled cask. Nice, kind of appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about what do you think about the weaponization of government agencies? It's extremely dangerous. It's um, and this is why, this is why I hate these perpetual wars, right? Because the state, as as any state grows, it grows at the expense of individual liberty. And when you don't put the fires out overseas, in the smallest, most precise surgical scalpel-like manner, when you start using a sledgehammer instead of a needle and all the bloat and all the other tools that you use to try to fight those wars instead of finishing something quickly, cleverly, all those tools eventually get turned on the populace. And that's hugely dangerous and that's antithetical to American liberty. And so, as I said before, the real, the real constitutional crisis we have in America is that we have four branches of government instead of three. We're supposed to have three, we have four. And that fourth is that permanent state bureaucracy that is unaccountable. And they start to use and abuse those tools for the benefit of one political party. And that's unacceptable. And that's the shit that, that makes people do more radical things to push back. Has that affected you at all personally? Yeah, sure. Even when, um, you know, the whole reason I got caught up in the Mueller investigation was because I was invited back to meet um, some UAE leadership after Trump was elected, uh, but before the inauguration, right? So there's still Obama people in charge at the NSC. And months later, they leaked the transcripts and, and, the, and the fact that I was in the UAE and they spun this wild-ass conspiracy that I was there meeting some Russian fund manager and it was all to establish a back channel to Russia. Like, wait a minute. This already this this meeting alleged to have happened two months after the U.S. election. How was I establishing some back channel to Russia to affect the U.S. election? So it's just that's the kind of nonsense. And again, lots of legal fees, seized phones, all the bullshit, and and the that weaponization, right? Whether it's the constant um, uh, bombardment in the media of bullshit that makes it banking harder, that makes capital raising harder, all the rest. I'm a, um, I'm a pretty stubborn, resilient guy, and I'll, I'll keep pushing through it, but um, that shit's got to end at some point. Yeah. There it, must be consequences. Does the IRS come after you as well? I, they've all come after me at some point. Yeah. I mean, it, it, look, that it, it was the, obviously this, it was the hottest by far after the um, the Nisra Square incident when the Democrats just focused on destroying Blackwater and destroying me. And um, you know, 
that was the, the real relief for the Raven 23 guys to finally be pardoned. Those were the last. Look, the business had been smashed at that point, but I felt like I had four people held <laughs> very unjustly. And uh, it was such a relief to have them out and have them back with their families. And, you know, and, and to hear the stories from the guys, um, none of them joined gangs. The, the pressure that you hear about being in a maximum security federal prison where there are some bad hombres. And none of the white supremacist gangs or the Muslim gangs or this gang, none of them came after the Blackwater guys because they had this kind of this aura of they were Blackwater guys, so stay away. And, and, and a number of them said that they had corrections officers that would say to them, Every night when they had to shut their cell, I'm so sorry to have to do this to you. Damn. You don't belong to be here. So I, I'm, I commend them for having as positive an attitude as they do. And it puts it in perspective, whatever bullshit I've had to go through, that they literally lost a numbers of years of their life. And they're now doing well at putting it back together. Yeah, I mean, they lost, what, from 2007 to... What, a year ago? Yeah. Less than a year ago. Yeah. Last December. Do you feel any resentment towards the country? Or, I mean, how do you... I'm going to be... I feel resentment on how veterans are treated, on, on when I look at the those pardons up there that are framed, when I look at Eddie Gallagher's charges. I feel a lot of fucking resentment towards the American population. Nobody fucking goes to bat for us, I feel like. These guys are being hung out to dry. Nobody gives a shit. It really, really it, it, fucking pisses me off. It's not... And I haven't been through... It, it doesn't even... It's whatever. It's not a fraction compared to what those men went through, What 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 how they've come after and smeared your name, vilified yeah. you. I, look, I don't think it's fair to blame the American population per se. And this is why. Because the average American wakes up every morning and they got to figure out how to get their kids to school. Hopefully they did their homework right. They got to get to work. And increasingly it has to be a two salary home because, because of the, the reduction in real wages that an average worker can earn, right? And we'll go into why that is. And they got to pay taxes and, and all the rest. And so they're... they're 99% of their day is focused on just getting through the day and feeding their family and, and doing what they're supposed to be doing. And they outsource, right? We have a republic. We don't have a democracy. We have a republic that we have elected officials that are supposed to be smart and, and um, serving the general good that we send forward for us to, uh, to make those decisions on our behalf. And I think the real lesson of COVID is the greatness of the federal system, okay? Because, my God, if all any and all decisions were only made in Washington, D.C., then we would truly be screwed. But thank God, right, I think it's a great lesson that mayors matter, that county councils matter, and, you know, that principle of subsidiarity, that it's best to make decisions as close to where they affect you as possible, and to not let that be made in a far off land. And so it's also a reminder that state governments really matter and good governors are great and bad governors, holy shit. And you see the exodus from bad, poorly run states running towards good run states. And I hope that the people that left those badly run states don't take their leftist bad policies with them. And so now it comes to Washington where we truly have a runaway size and scope of federal government that makes decisions without any accountability. And some of that comes back to decisions made a long time ago, like in the progressive era, a hundred years ago, when they pushed through income tax, right? Because America used to be run only on tariffs, on the import, on, the, on a tax, on any goods that were imported to America. That's it. The federal government, rightly, was small. What is the most successful political party platform in the last century? The Socialist Workers Party. Their party platform of the 20s 
was cradle to grave welfare, social security, direct income tax, basically cradle to grave socialism. That has been not only adopted by the Democratic Party platform, but it's been adopted into law, even voted on and approved on a continuing basis by many Republicans. They also changed to direct election of senators, right? The, count, the founding fathers had it right that when a, um, uh, a the, the, of course, the, the House is voted every two years direct from the people. The Senate was supposed to come from a choice from the state legislatures so that the state of Tennessee would elect two senators from the Tennessee state legislature and send it forward to Washington so that those senators did the bidding and did the protection of those states' rights. And when we went away from that, now that senator, eh, yeah, they might be elected by the state, but all the money for their campaign can come from some national interest group generally focused on growing the size of government or enlarging the monopoly or duopoly enjoyed by some, some large corporation that's unregulated. So between that, as the government grows, uh, and, and I'd say the, the other real the thing we need to push back on is to remember the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, right? All powers not specifically delegated to the state to the federal government remain the sole purview of the states. And so that pendulum is swung way too far towards Washington. We need to swing that back towards um, towards states' rights, towards smaller government, into more decisions being made at the state and local level. I think the other great challenge we face economically, right? So for the last 70 years, we've enjoyed the dollar being the world's reserve currency, right? All major trades in oil, in, in foreign trade, in grains, in, in agri-products, all clears in dollars, okay? And what that allows Washington to do is spend trillions of dollars extra we spent, now we're at, the national debt is like $33 trillion. And that's up almost double in the last 15, 18 years. I mean, extraordinary rate of spending. <clears throat> the problem, right, and, and part of that, part of the of the aura or the, the facade of the, of the dollar being the world's reserve currency is that there's this American military hegemony. Right? We have this amazing military that can smack any target, anytime, anywhere. And, and when you have the debacle that was Afghanistan, a failure in Iraq, a failure of deterrence in Ukraine, and we'll talk about Taiwan next, when you have those kind of setbacks, and now, right, when, when, when that failure of deterrence now leads to conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and now everybody goes hog wild on sanctioning everything Russia, right? Russia is still the largest energy producer in the world. They're going to sell their self, they're going to sell their stuff somewhere and somebody's going to buy it, right? Less than half of the world, uh, less than half of all the countries at the UN actually signed on to sanctions against Russia, right? Which leads all those other countries outside of that sanction still going to trade with Russia. And so what does Russia demand? They want to be paid in rubles. Yeah. And they'll trade with India, who can pay with rupees, and the Chinese uh, we'll pay with uh, renminbi, right? So they call it the three R's. And so they create a trading block to further reduce the the hegemony that the dollar has in trade. And so trust me, bank on this. When, when the dollar loses that status, then our idiots in Washington can't spend an extra trillion dollars a year like we do almost every year in debt. And when America has to finally live within its means and start to pay that debt back, Holy shit! That is, that is society transforming level change. What does that look like? And it's coming soon. It's a diet. It is. A, it's this. This nation. It, it and it, and it's good and it's bad. In yin and yang, right? It is short term real pain, recession, depression, severe distortions uh, of the economy. But putting Washington on a diet is not a not a terrible idea, because. You will throw out a lot of the crazy, woke insanity that has been that has been not just in Washington. That's even been sh sh seeping down to the state level with all the federal grants that flow 
everywhere else. If we have to get back to basics as a country, then um, uh, it'll be run a lot more like hometown America and not like Washington, D.C., New York, or L.A., or San Francisco, for that matter. How long do you think that could take to play out? And is it inevitable we're going there? I'm not some great economist visionary, but just looking at what's happened in the past, right? When, the, and what's scary about it all, you took a country like Germany that lost World War I, and they printed and printed and printed money. And the mighty history of the German-Prussian society collapsed and all that wealth was destroyed because it went from, you know, one mark, one German mark to buy a loaf of bread up to a billion marks to buy a loaf of bread. Just hyperinflation that ran away and the German society elected a psychopath like Adolf Hitler. And that's the, that's the kind of insanity we have to prevent uh, because, look, the United States... And the constitutional government we, we live under is still the greatest form of government on earth, on this planet that has ever been done. And it is worth protecting. It is worth um, returning to those original roots because the alternatives, right? There's, there's nowhere else to go, right? I, the other thing that <laughs> uh, was alarming to me there was a poll done about three weeks after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It was a Quinnipiac poll, right? Not a right-wing poll at all. And it said, how many people in America, if the country was invaded, would stay and fight? 75% of Republicans said less than 50% of Democrats. No, I'm sorry, 40% of Democrats said they would stay and fight to defend the country. Both those numbers were way too low. Yeah. And so, you know, a country is a country when its people have some commonly held beliefs, right? A society, that, that's generally a description of what makes a society. And when we as a society can't even agree on what is male and female anymore, then we have some real fundamental problems. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Let's move into China taken Taiwan sure look Taiwan right was um, the island of Formosa until um, 1949 when the nationalist government got pushed out of mainland China by the Communist Party right the nationalists lost the Civil War they go to Taiwan they go to Formosa now it becomes the island of Taiwan and a and be the politics back and forth from 1949 till now. Uh, it's not fully independent, not recognized independent. Um, but the Chinese, the the Chinese Communist Party, hates the idea of Taiwan, wants to reabsorb it exactly like they've done to Hong Kong fully. Because Taiwan is Han Chinese culture, but on freedom, not on communism, and so even that that irritant of 30 million Taiwanese living, breathing, speaking, traveling freely is antithetical to the CCP control that they demand on the entire 1.4 billion Chinese citizens. And so they have made it their policy for a long time now to retake it, and they've spent billions and ten, hundreds of billions of dollars building their military, building a capability to retake it by force, I think um, the the stumbles of the Russians invading Ukraine have certainly given them some pause because Russia was their main, certainly their main military supplier um, and their mentor, and they had a lot of respect for the Russian military. And to see it stumble as badly as they have uh, will certainly give them pause. An amphibious invasion, as you know, being a frogman, is the hardest kind of invasion to do, right? And it's one thing if you're a tank division on the Russian side of the border in Ukraine, you let the clutch out and you roll across the border. But doing an amphibious operation across 70 miles of open ocean 
onto a rocky island, generally into an urban area where there's mount immediately with a lot of sanctuary inland that, that opposition forces can can hide and fight and rally from and, and from the ta- a tunnel and cave system. That's a, that is a more complex problem. And so uh, I hope the Taiwanese take their defense seriously. The idea of Americans going and fighting there, I have a real issue with when the Taiwanese are not even spending 2% of their GDP, like most of our NATO so-called partners are not spending 2% of their budgets on defense. When the Taiwanese um, wake up and do that, um, you know, well, I, I hope the Taiwanese are not depending on US government to save them because they will be sorely disappointed. And the other thing that's challenging, right? If you, So if you're China, I wouldn't lead with a straight out invasion. They'll probably cause some issue or some crisis on some of the smaller islands owned by Taiwan, right? Where there's a hundred or 200 man garrison of Taiwanese soldiers. And I can see the, the, the CCP sending their maritime militia, which is basically a fishing fleet with some soldiers on board to go and see some of those islands like they've done uh, throughout the South China Sea um, even some of those from the Philippines. In my travels in China, uh, I actually met the CEO of the Chinese state-owned enterprise. I think it was like China Port and Dredging Company that built all those islands of the South China Sea. And he said, we never had it in our wildest dreams to build those islands. But we found the Obama administration to be so vapid that we just took it. We wow. just said, go. And so now they've built dozens of bases all through the South China Sea. Um, and of course, they first said, well, it's just for trade purposes and for we're going to watch the weather. And now, of course, they're fully weaponized with surface to air missiles and surface to surface and airfields and ports. And they built little fixed aircraft carriers all through the, the, the South China Sea. And I understand why they're doing that. I don't agree with it, but remember, every threat, right? You've heard of the Great Wall of China, right? And that was to prevent Mongol horsemen from coming in from the north, right? Off of, off of Mongolia and, and, the, and the Russian steppe. So they built that wall a millennia ago to stop that. This time, the Chinese built a great maritime wall of China because every problem they've had during what they call the, the century of humiliation, which started in the 1840s with the Opium Wars and the British, right? Which led to the the Hong Kong Kowloon trade colony. First it was the Brits, then it was the Americans 20, 30 years later, and then the Boxer issue where uh, the Chinese uh, resisted against all the um, Western trade colonies that were in, in China around Shanghai. And then of course the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy all of those problems came by sea. And so China is trying to move their buffer out by doing that to the detriment of all their neighbors. And it's probably had more of an effect of bringing all the neighbors together against China than, uh, than what they really bargained for. What does it look like for the world if they do take Taiwan? <clears throat> well, if they, if it's a, here's the thing, <clears throat> Putin, kind of believed his own, he believed his own bullshit from his generals and intelligence chiefs that, hey, don't worry, we're going to roll in there, they're going to welcome us as heroes, and it's all going to be over in a few days. And it was clearly not the case. And as imperfect as Ukrainian democracy might be, I have to commend the people that they showed up to fight, right? Some of the women left the country, the men went and did their part and, and got it on. Good on them. If Taiwan can organize itself to to block and hold and to prevent an immediate collapse of the of the government and to keep resisting it will force the rest of the world to to get them aid somehow and to close off and to sanction China uh, and to make it more isolated and so that's the I think that's the calculus that Xi Jinping and the the standing committee and the Politburo have to figure out because remember they've spent Hundreds of billions of dollars building their military, still untested. All those senior officers 
And as much as we might complain about U.S. senior officers, all the Chinese senior officers have bought and paid for their positions. They are political generals, completely nothing based on merit to get to those kind of ranks in the Chinese Communist Party. So, so the question of amphibious operation, hard. Do they really know what the will of the Taiwanese people are, right? Because if there's 29 million people and only, what, 3% decide to stand and fight, 3% of 29 is still a lot of people, especially fighting from, a, from, from an urban, defendable terrain. Yeah. What about the computer chip? I mean, they're gonna, if they do <clears throat> Taiwan's, take it. Yeah, look, the amount of computer chip production that's in Taiwan is significant. And I think Taiwan Semiconductor is spending $10 billion in Arizona right now building factories. That's good. That's, again, instead of spending $40 billion to Ukraine, let's spend more money or give a loan guarantee or something to move more of that capacity to America. I think all the supply chain debacle we're feeling in the United States uh, is a stark reminder that things can go to shit pretty quickly, right? Whether it's being dependent on China for things as simple as antibiotics and Advil or painkillers or PP or per personal protective equipment or computer chips or batteries for cars or whatever. Look, the... Um, the free trade promise of NAFTA and of admitting China into the World Trade Organization was an elite decision made in Washington that has largely enriched the coastal elites and the private equity crowd, and it has hollowed out many um, or most of, of middle America, right? It's led to wage depression. It's led to a lot of unemployment, opiate addiction, all those those bad things that come from despair, like I said a, a few minutes ago, of that average guy that wakes up every morning and is trying to feed his family, get their kids off to school, and, uh, and keep a roof over their head. They outsource the decision-making to the people that are supposed to be smart. And the elites in America have let us down again and again and again. And now, I think the next administration, there has to be choices made. <clears throat> when when you look at how America, right after World War II, it's like the Cold War started immediately. And so we kind of immediately, it was us and them. It was a pro-freedom capitalism market versus a Soviet government-controlled, no liberty, right? You work, you, you're owned by the state. With China, <clears throat> the, the paradigm was if, if we, by trading with them and providing them technology, we make China rich, that will make them like us. And that has proven to be an absolute fallacy. And so by making them rich, they've actually hurt a huge segment of our economy, of our manufacturing base, which has all been shipped to China. And, uh, and they continue to steal technology um, without limitation. And they've kind of continued their same, uh, I would say totalitarian policies. Um, and now, you know, even even at the point now of putting in the whole, whole social credit score and the monitoring and the surveillance state, it's kind of an, an Orwellian nightmare gone amok. And so seeing that enough in China, I will fight with every last drop of my blood to prevent that, that paradigm from soaking into America. Moving into our last topic, what does the future of warfare look like with all the new tech that's coming out it's already i mean it's already, in the past 20 years it's completely different out there on the battlefield and and where do you think we're headed well as that siege in mariupol showed that combat still comes down to controlling block by block bunker by bunker and that combat is not surgical clean technical or whatever and that um, it still comes down to controlling ground. And, and, you know, military victories drive diplomatic breakthroughs. So the future of warfare, however people want to think that we can techno-wizardry our way into success, yes, tech certainly has a role. And, uh, you know, think of it this way. 
the the Pentagon talks about strategic offsets. Like, what is the strategic advantage that we have that our enemies don't have, so that we can always be assured of a win? Right. The first strategic offset was nuclear weapons. Right. We were trying to always be out in front of the Soviets to out nuke them if we had to. And then it went to precision strike. Right. Like what we rolled out in the mid '80s to '90s, which you saw in Gulf War One, Gulf War Two now taken to an extreme amount where you can smoke a guy in a moving you know, SUV and kill one guy in the car but not somebody outside the car, right? The most surgical precision strike because, you know, that's, that's the mandate. But now, precision strike is in the hands of everybody from ISIS, right? Who can fly a drone and with a camera, drop a grenade from 2,000 feet in the air and, and fly and, and drop that grenade through a, a open hatch on a Humvee, when it's proliferated to that level, when you can do precision strike with stuff that you can pull together from a radio shack, we clearly don't have the monopoly there anymore. So then it will be, I think, um, it's going to have to come down to autonomy and some kind of autonomous weapons that can fly in a largely 100% jammed environment and still try to find this objective and, and destroy it. So communication, navigation become exceedingly difficult. I think um, if you're China and you wanna figure out how do we blind America, what are they dependent on? Comms. They've overcommed themselves to death. Um, so they probably, maybe they crank off an EMP in, um, in the atmosphere somewhere to block or to either fry or, or block that satellite transmission. Um, how do you navigate? I think it's very important for people to teach people uh, celestial navigation and, and all the basics of, of when all the other tech is stripped away, what are you left with? So it's, um, I think there's nothing that new in warfare. It's just how you apply uh, some new toy, new, new tools in uh, in old ways. What about propaganda? Right, you think about the other thing, right? Despite all the tech, weather still matters. Weather so far in Ukraine has totally been on the side of the defender. The the cuz Ukraine has got lots of farm fields. And what are farm fields covered with snow? They're muddy. Unless it's frozen super hard, which even by the time Putin had invaded, that was starting to fade. So now all his heavy armor vehicles and truck and logistics support are channeled onto very narrow, very defined roads, which are easy to target by ambush or artillery or whatever. But now, as the fields dry in Ukraine, as we get towards June, right? The, the biggest tank battle in history was June 3, the Battle of Kursk, just north of where they're fighting now. Um, because the fields could dry, so you had massive maneuver spaces for those kind of armor forces. So that's still well within the realm of possible. How much propaganda do you think, or how much does propaganda have a role in the future? Of course it does. Okay, it's always, it seems it's always like it's had, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's, it, it, look, propaganda has always had a role in, in warfare, and it's... Um, as we become more and more uh, glued to our phones and what's pushed in front of us, it's um, uh, it definitely affects the morale, the the will to fight or the will not to fight uh, or to help somebody. And the Ukrainians have done a very good job of uh, of ringing that bell for uh, for propaganda, right? I mean, again, Zelensky has come out with some great one-liners, very photogenic stuff, and. Um, uh, they have, and, and look, in defense of them, it's their country, they were clearly invaded. Um, it's not like the Ukrainians were actually threatening to, uh, to invade Russia. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a pretty clear aggressor here, so it's pretty easy to pile on uh, with propaganda on top of that. What do you think the biggest threat to the United States is at this point? Our biggest threat is internal is again, if we can't even agree on what's male and female anymore, if we can't even agree on what is a free and fair election, if we can't even agree, right? And because the other attribute of a country is something that has defined and defended borders, 
right? So we have one party that's intentionally erasing borders, that is doing, I would say, some very questionable things around elections. If you haven't seen the movie 2000 Mules, watch it. I don't think anybody can say that the the 2020 election was the freest and fairest in history after watching that, right? If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, and so that kind of election fraud must not happen again. And I think the, uh, the rule by elites um, has led us down a, uh, an extremely dangerous path. Um, the hegemony that America has experienced Right, because we came out of World War II with a massive industrial base, undamaged by war. Right, Japan smoked, Germany smoked, Russia smoked. We put some money into some of those places to help rebuild them, but those economies came roaring back. But we have been kind of, or we've kind of become like a, an obese triathlete. Um, we're still kind of running, we're still kind of at it, but we're we're not in our prime shape right now because we've done a lot of um, incremental bad habits which have never been cleaned up. So you think the recession is going to pull us out of this? What do you mean? Pull us down? No, pull us. We're going to come out. We had talked earlier about a recession, maybe a depression. Uh, and well, look, there's, in the there's, long run, there's definitely going to be... Us. We can't have... A, the, the, there's been so much stimulus thrown at the economy... That's why there's so much inflation right now. And so you have to soak up some of that excess funds with a higher interest rate. And that's going to cause a contraction in economic activity. And so the question is, you know, like Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Fed in the 1980s for Reagan, right? He ran interest rates quite high and there was some pretty strong medicine for a couple of years, um, which soaked up the inflation. But at the same time, Reagan was cutting, cutting taxes and cutting regulations and and kind of taking the boot off the neck of the American entrepreneur in what was then a much more competitive economy that we have now because we've allowed so much concentration in so many industries where you only have one or two major competitors in most of these places. So whether it's a single maker or a single buyer of a product, in both cases, the consumer gets screwed. So the next presidency has to have a massively increased Federal Trade Commission DOJ that's focused on, on on breaking up monopolistic activity and return competition, and that will allow people's wages to uh, to rise again. Well, I want to wrap this interview up, and 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 this is a phenomenal interview. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. What's next for you? What do you got coming up? Um, working on some things in the communication space. That will be uh, spectacular, and I'll come back and talk to you about it when I do. Perfect. All right. All right. Well, Thanks, best man. of luck to you, and, and seriously, I really appreciate it. It's been an honor. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.